Chapter 87 of the Virginians. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Virginians by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 87 The Last of God Save the King. What perverse law of fate is it that ever places me in the minority? Should a law be proposed to hand over this realm to the pretender of Rome or the Grand Turk, and submit it to the new sovereign's religion, it might pass, as I should certainly be voting against it. At home in Virginia, I found myself disagreeing with everybody, as usual. By the patriots I was voted, as indeed I professed myself to be, a Tory. By the Tories I was presently declared to be a dangerous Republican. The time was utterly out of joint. Oh, cursed spite! Ere I had been a year in Virginia, how I wished myself back by the banks of the Waveney. But the aspect of affairs was so troublous that I could not leave my mother, a lone lady, to face possible war and disaster, nor would she quit the country at such a juncture. Nor should a man of spirit leave it. At His Excellency's table, and over His Excellency's plentiful claret, that point was agreed on by numbers of the well-affected. That vow was vowed over countless brimming bumpers. No, it was statue signum signifere. We cavaliers would all rally round it, and at these times our governor talked like the bravest of the brave. Now, I will say, of all my Virginian acquaintance, Madame Esmond was the most consistent. Our gentlefolks had come in numbers to Williamsburg, and a great number of them proposed to treat Her Excellency, the Governor's Lady, to a ball, when the news reached us of the Boston Port Bill. Straightway the House of Burgesses adopts an indignant protest against this measure of the British Parliament, and decrees a solemn day of fast and humiliation throughout the country, and of solemn prayer to heaven to avert the calamity of civil war. Meanwhile, the invitation to my lady Dunmore having been already given and accepted, the gentlemen agreed that their ball should take place on the appointed evening, and then sackcloth and ashes should be assumed some days afterwards. "'A ball,' says Madame Esmond. "'I go to a ball which is given by a set of rebels who are going publicly to insult his majesty a week afterwards. I will die sooner.' and she wrote to the gentlemen who were stewards for the occasion to say that viewing the dangerous state of the country she for her part could not think of attending a ball what was her surprise then the next time she went abroad in her chair to be cheered by a hundred persons white and black and shouts of huzzah madam heaven bless your ladyship they evidently thought her patriotism had caused her determination not to go to the ball. Madam, that there should be no mistake, puts her head out of the chair and cries out, God save the king, as loud as she can. The people cried, God save the king, too. Everybody cried, God save the king, in those days. On the night of the entertainment, my poor Harry, as a burgess of the house, and one of the givers of the feast, donned his uniform red coat of wolf's, which he so soon was to exchange for another color, and went off with Madame Fanny to the ball. My Lady Warrington and her humble servant, as being strangers in the country, and English people as it were, were permitted by Madame to attend the assembly from which she, of course, absented herself. I had the honor to dance a country dance with the Lady of Mount Vernon, whom I found a most lively, pretty, and amiable partner, but am bound to say that my wife's praises of her were received with a very grim acceptance by my mother, when Lady Warrington came to recount the events of the evening. Could not Sir George Warrington have danced with my Lady Dunmore, or her daughters, or with anybody but Mrs. Washington? To be sure, the Colonel thought so well of himself and his wife, that no doubt he considered her the grandest lady in the room, and she who remembered him a road surveyor at a guinea a day. Well, indeed, there was no measuring the pride of these provincial upstarts, and as for this gentleman, my lord Dunmore's partiality for him had evidently turned his head, 
I do not know about Mr. Washington's pride. I know that my good mother never could be got to love him or anything that was his. She was no better pleased with him for going to the ball than with his conduct three days afterwards, when the day of fast and humiliation was appointed, and when he attended the service which our new clergyman performed. She invited Mr. Bellman to dinner that day, and sundry colonial authorities. The clergyman excused himself. Madame Esmond tossed up her head and said he might do as he liked. She made a parade of a dinner. She lighted her house up at night when all the rest of the city was in darkness and gloom. She begged Mr. Hardy, one of His Excellency's aides-de-camp, to sing God Save the King, to which the people in the street outside listened, thinking that it might be a part of some religious service which Madame was celebrating. But then she called for Britons strike home, which the simple young gentleman just from Europe began to perform, when a great yell arose in the street, and a large stone, flung from some rebellious hand, plumped into the punch-bowl before me, and scattered it and its contents about our dining-room. My mother went to the window, nothing daunted. I can see her rigid little figure now, as she stands with a tossed-up head, outstretched frilled arms, and the twinkling stars for a background, and sings in chorus, Britain, strike home, strike home. The crowd in front of the palings shout and roar, Silence, for shame, go back. But she will not go back, not she. Fling more stones, if you dare, says the brave little lady. And more might have come, but some gentleman issuing out of the Raleigh Tavern interposed with the crowd. You mustn't insult the lady, says a voice I think I know. Huzzah, Colonel! Hurrah, Captain! God bless your honor, say the people in the street, and thus the enemies are pacified. My mother, protesting that the whole disturbance was over, would have had Mr. Hardy sing another song, but he gave a sickly grin and said he really did not like to sing to such accompaniments. And the concert for that evening was ended though I am bound to say that some scoundrels returned at night, frightened my poor wife almost out of wits, and broke every single window in front of our tenement. Britain's strike home was a little too much. Madame should have contented herself with God save the king. Militia was drilled, bullets were cast, supplies of ammunition got ready, cunning plans for disappointing the royal ordinances devised, and carried out. But to be sure, God save the king was the cry everywhere. And in reply to my objections to the gentlemen patriots, why are you scheming for a separation? You are bringing down upon you the inevitable wrath of the greatest power in the world. The answer to me always was, we mean no separation at all. We yield to no men in loyalty. We glory in the name of Britons and so forth and so forth. The powder-barrels were heaped in the cellar, the train was laid, but Mr. Fox was persistent in his dutiful petitions to King and Parliament, and meant no harm, not he. Tis true when I spoke to the power of our country, I imagined she would exert it, that she would not expect to overcome three millions of fellow Britons on their own soil with a few battalions, a half-dozen generals from Bond Street, and a few thousand bravos hired out of Germany. As if we wanted to insult the thirteen colonies as well as to subdue them, we must set upon them these hordes of Hessians, and the murderers out of the Indian wigwams. Was our great quarrel not to be fought without tali auxilio and istis defensoribus? Ah, tis easy, now we are worsted, to look over the map of the great empire wrested from us, and show how we ought not to have lost it. Long Island ought to have exterminated Washington's army. He ought never to have come out of Valley Forge except as a prisoner. The South was ours after the Battle of Camden, but for the inconceivable meddling of the commander-in-chief at New York, who paralyzed the exertions of the only capable British general who appeared during the war, and sent him into that miserable cul-de-sac at Yorktown, whence he could only issue defeated and a prisoner. Oh, for a week more, 
a day more, an hour more of darkness or light. In reading over our American campaigns from their unhappy commencement to their inglorious end, now that we are able to see the enemy's movements and conditions as well as our own, I fancy we can see how an advance, a march, might have put enemies into our power who had no means to withstand it, and changed the entire issue of the struggle. But it was ordained by heaven, and for the good, as we can now have no doubt, of both empires, that the great western republic should separate from us. And the gallant soldiers who fought on her side, their indomitable and heroic chief above all, had the glory of facing and overcoming not only veteran soldiers, amply provided and inured to war, but wretchedness, cold, hunger, dissensions, treason within their own camp, where all must have gone to rack but for the pure unquenchable flame of patriotism that was forever burning in the bosom of the heroic leader. What a constancy! What a magnanimity! What a surprising persistence against fortune! Washington before the enemy was no better nor braver than hundreds that fought with him or against him. Who has not heard the repeated sneers against Fabius in which his factious captains were accustomed to indulge? But Washington, the chief of a nation in arms, doing battle with distracted parties, calm in the midst of conspiracy, serene against the open foe before him and the darker enemies at his back, Washington inspiring order and spirit into troops hungry and in rags, stung by ingratitude, but betraying no anger, and ever ready to forgive, in defeat invincible magnanimous in conquest, and never so sublime as on that day when he laid down his victorious sword and sought his noble retirement. Here indeed is a character to admire and revere, a life without a stain, a fame without a flaw. Quando invenies parem, in that more extensive work which I have planned and partly written on the subject of this great war, I hope I have done justice to the character of its greatest leader. And I trust that in the opinions I have recorded regarding him, I have shown that I also can be just and magnanimous towards those who view me personally with no favor. For my brother Hal being at Mount Vernon, and always eager to bring me and his beloved chief on good terms, showed His Excellency some of the early sheets of my history. General Washington, who read but few books, and had not the slightest pretensions to literary taste, remarked, If you will have my opinion, my dear General, I think Sir George's projected work, from the specimen I have of it, is certain to offend both parties. G. E. W. And this from the sheer force of respect which his eminent virtues extorted. With the young Mr. Washington of my own early days, I had not the honor to enjoy much sympathy though my brother, whose character is much more frank and affectionate than mine, was always his fast friend in early times, when they were equals, as in latter days when the general, as I do own and think, was all mankind superior. I have mentioned that contrariety in my disposition, and perhaps in my brother's, which somehow placed us on wrong sides in the quarrel which ensued, and which from this time forth raged for five years, until the mother country was fain to acknowledge her defeat. Harry should have been the Tory, and I the Whig. Theoretically, my opinions were much more liberal than those of my brother, who, especially after his marriage, became what our Indian nabobs call a Bahadur, a person ceremonious, stately, and exacting respect. When my Lord Dunmore, for instance, talked about liberating the negroes so as to induce them to join the king's standard hal was for hanging the governor and the black guards as he called them whom his excellency had crimped if you gentlemen are fighting for freedom says i sure the negroes may fight too on which harry roars out shaking his fists infernal villains if i meet any of them they shall die by this hand and my mother agreed that this idea of a negro insurrection 
was the most abominable and parricidal notion which ever had sprung up in her unhappy country. She, at least, was more consistent than Brother Howe. She would have black and white obedient to the powers that be. Whereas Hal only could admit that freedom was the right of the latter color. As a proof of her argument, Madame Esmond, and Harry too, would point to an instance in our own family, in the person of Mr. Gumbo. Having got his freedom from me, as a reward for his admirable love and fidelity to me when times were hard, Gumbo, on his return to Virginia, was scarce a welcome guest in his old quarters amongst my mother's servants. He was free and they were not. He was, as it were, a centre of insurrection. He gave himself no small airs of protection and consequence amongst them, bragging of his friends in Europe, at home, as he called it, and his doings there, and for a while bringing the household round about him to listen to him and admire him like the monkey who had seen the world. Now Sadie, Hal's boy, who went to America of his own desire, was not free. Hence jealousies between him and Mr. Gum, and battles in which they both practiced the noble art of boxing and butting, which they had learned at Marybone Gardens and hockey in the hole. Nor was Sadie the only jealous person. Almost all my mother's servants hated Signor Gumbo for the airs which he gave himself, and I am sorry to say that our faithful Molly, his wife, was as jealous as his old fellow-servants. The blacks could not pardon her for having demeaned herself so far as to marry one of their kind. She met with no respect, could exercise no authority, came to her mistress with ceaseless complaints of the idleness, knavery, lies, stealing of the black people, and finally with a story of jealousy against a certain Dinah or Diana, who, I heartily trust, was as innocent as her namesake, the moonlight visitant of Endymion. Now, on the article of morality, Madame Esmond was a very draconess, and a person accused was a person guilty. She made charges against Mr. Gumbo, to which he replied with asperity. Forgetting that he was a free gentleman, my mother now ordered Gumbo to be whipped, on which Molly flew at her ladyship, all her wrath at her husband's infidelity vanishing at the idea of the indignity put upon him. There was a rebellion at our house at Castlewood. A quarrel took place between me and my mother, as I took my man's side. Hal and Fanny sided with her, on the contrary, and in so far the difference did good, as it brought about some little intimacy between Madame and her younger children. This little difference was speedily healed, but it was clear that the standard of insurrection must be removed out of our house, and we determined that Mr. Gumbo and his lady should return to Europe. My wife and I would willingly have gone with them, God wot, for our boy sickened and lost his strength and caught the fever in our swampy country. But at this time she was expecting to lie in, of our son Henry, and she knew, too, that I had promised to stay in Virginia. It was agreed that we should send the two back, but when I offered Theo to go, she said her place was with her husband. Her father and Hetty at home would take care of our children, and she scarce would allow me to see a tear in her eyes whilst she was making her preparations for the departure of her little ones. Dost thou remember the time, madam, and the silence round the work-tables, as the piles of little shirts are made ready for the voyage? and the stealthy visits to the children's chambers whilst they are asleep and yet with you, and the terrible time of parting, as our barge with the servants and children rose to the ship, and you stand on the shore. Had the Prince of Wales been going on that voyage, he could not have been better provided. Where, sirrah, is the Tompion watch your grandmother gave you? And how did you survive the boxes of cakes which the good lady stowed away in your cabin? The ship which took out my poor Theo's children returned with the Reverend Mr. Hagen and my Lady Maria on board, who meekly chose to resign her rank, and was known in the colony, which was not to be a colony very long, only as Mrs. Hagen. At the time when I was in favour with my Lord Dunmore, 
a living falling vacant in Westmoreland County, he gave it to our kinsman, who arrived in Virginia time enough to christen our boy Henry and to preach some sermons on the then gloomy state of affairs, which Madam Esmond pronounced to be prodigious fine. I think my lady Maria won Madam's heart by insisting on going out of the room after her. "'My father, your brother, was an earl, tis true,' says she, "'but you know your ladyship is a marquis's daughter, and I never can think of taking precedence of you.' So fond did Madam become of her niece that she even allowed Hagen to read plays, my own humble compositions amongst others, and was fairly forced to own that there was merit in the tragedy of Pocahontas, which our parson delivered with uncommon energy and fire. Hal and his wife came but rarely to Castlewood and Richmond when the chaplain and his lady were with us. Fanny was very curt and rude with Maria, used to giggle and laugh strangely in her company, and repeatedly remind her of her age, to our mother's astonishment, who would often ask, was there any cause of quarrel between her niece and her daughter-in-law? I kept my own counsel on these occasions, and was often not a little touched by the meekness with which the elder lady bore her persecutions. Fanny loved to torture her in her husband's presence, who, poor fellow, was also in happy ignorance about his wife's early history, and the other bore her agony wincing as little as might be. I sometimes would remonstrate with Madame Harry, and ask her was she a Red Indian that she tortured her victims so? "'Have not I had torture enough in my time?' says the young lady, and looked as though she was determined to pay back the injuries inflicted on her. "'Nay,' says I, "'you were bred in our wigwam, and I don't remember anything but kindness.' "'Kindness!' cries she. "'No slave was ever treated as I was. The blows which wound most often are those which never are aimed.' The people who hate us are not those we have injured. I thought of little Fanny in our early days, silent, smiling, willing to run and do all our biddings for us, and I grieved for my poor brother, who had taken this sly creature into his bosom. End of chapter 87「Chapter 88 of the Virginians – this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Virginians by William Makepeace Thackeray Chapter 88 Yankee Doodle Comes to Town One of the uses to which we put America in the days of our British dominion was to make it a refuge for our sinners. Besides convicts and assigned servants whom we transported to our colonies, we discharged on their shores scapegraces and younger sons, for whom dissipation, despair, and bailiffs made the old country uninhabitable. And as Mr. Cook, in his voyages, made his newly discovered islanders presents of English animals and other specimens of European civilization, we used to take care to send samples of our black sheep over to the colonies, there to browse as best they might and propagate their precious breed. I myself was perhaps a little guilty in this manner, in busying myself to find a living in America for the worthy Hagen, husband of my kinswoman, at least was guilty in so far as this, that as we could get him no employment in England, we were glad to ship him to Virginia and give him a colonial pulpit cushion to thump. He demeaned himself there as a brave, honest gentleman, to be sure, he did his duty thoroughly by his congregation and his king too, and in so far did credit to my small patronage. Madame Theo used to urge this when I confided to her in my scruples of conscience on this subject, and show, as her custom was and is, that my conduct in this, as in all other matters, was dictated by the highest principle of morality and honor. But would I have given Hagen our living at home? and selected him and his wife to minister to our parish? I fear not. I never had a doubt of our cousin's sincere repentance, but I think I was secretly glad when she went to work it out in the wilderness, and I say this acknowledging my pride and my error. Twice, when I wanted the most, 
This kind Maria aided me with her sympathy and friendship. She bore her own distresses courageously, and soothed those of others with admirable affection and devotion. And yet I, and some of mine, not Theo, would look down upon her. Oh, for shame! For shame on our pride! My poor Lady Maria was not the only one of our family who was to be sent out of the way to American wildernesses. Having borrowed, stolen, cheated at home until he could cheat, borrow, and steal no more, the Honorable William Esmond Esquire was accommodated with a place at New York, and his noble brother and royal master heartily desired that they might see him no more. When the troubles began, we heard of the fellow and his doings in his new habitation. Lies and mischief were his avant couriers wherever he travelled. My Lord Dunmore informed me that Mr. Will declared publicly that our estate of Castlewood was only ours during his brother's pleasure, that his father, out of consideration for Madame Esmond, his lordship's half-sister, had given her the place for life, and that he, William, was in negotiation with his brother, the present Lord Castlewood, for the purchase of the reversion of the estate. We had the deed of gift in our strong room at Castlewood, and it was furthermore registered in due form at Williamsburg, so that we were easy on that score. But the intention was everything, and Hal and I promised, as soon as ever we met Mr. William, to get from him a confirmation of this pretty story. What Madame Esmond's feelings and expressions were when she heard it, I need scarcely here particularize. What? "'My father, the Marquis of Esmond, was a liar, and I am a cheat, am I?' cries my mother. "'He will take my son's property at my death, will he?' And she was for writing not only to Lord Castlewood in England, but to His Majesty himself at St. James, and was only prevented by my assurance that Mr. Will's lies were notorious amongst all his acquaintance, and that we could not expect, in our own case, that he should be so inconsistent as to tell the truth. We heard of him presently as one of the loudest amongst the loyalists in New York, as captain and presently major of a corps of volunteers who were sending their addresses to the well-disposed in all the other colonies, and announcing their perfect readiness to die for their mother country. We could not lie in a house without a whole window, and closing the shutters of that unlucky mansion we had hired at Williamsburg, Madame Esmond left our little capital and my family returned to Richmond, which also was deserted by the members of the dissolved assembly. Captain Hal and his wife returned pretty early to their plantation, and I, not a little annoyed at the course which events were taking, divided my time pretty much between my own family and that of our governor, who professed himself very eager to have my advice and company. There were the strongest political differences, but as yet no actual personal quarrel. Even after the dissolution of our House of Assembly, the members of which adjourned to a tavern and there held that famous meeting, where I believe the idea of a Congress of all the colonies was first proposed, the gentlemen who were strongest in opposition remained good friends with His Excellency, partook of his hospitality, and joined him in excursions of pleasure. The session over, the gentry went home and had meetings in their respective counties, and the assemblies in most of the other provinces, having been also abruptly dissolved, it was agreed everywhere that a general congress should be held. Philadelphia, as the largest and most important city on our continent, was selected as the place of meeting, and those celebrated conferences began, which were but the angry preface of war. We were still at God Save the King. We were still presenting our humble petitions to the throne. But when I went to visit my brother Harry at Fanny's Mount, his new plantation lay not far from ours, but with Rappahannock between us, and towards Mattapony River, he rode out on business one morning, and I in the afternoon happened to ride too, and was told by one of the grooms that Master was gone towards Willis's ordinary, in which direction, thinking no harm, I followed and upon a clear place not far from Willis's, as I advance out of the wood, I come on Captain Hal on horseback, with three or four-and-thirty countrymen round about him, armed with every sort of weapon, pike, 
scythe, fowling piece, and musket, and the captain, with two or three likely young fellows as officers under him, putting the men through their exercise. As I rode up, a queer expression comes over Hal's face. Present arms, says he, and the army tries to perform the salute as well they could. Captain Cade, this is my brother, Sir George Warrington. As a relation of yours, Colonel, says the individual addressed as Captain, the gentleman is welcome, and he holds out a hand accordingly. And, and a true friend to Virginia, says Hal, with a reddening face. Yes, please God, gentlemen, say I, on which the regiment gives a hearty huzzé for the colonel and his brother. The drill over, the officers and the men, too, were for a journey to Willis's and taking some refreshment. But Colonel Howe said he could not drink with them that afternoon, and we trotted homewards together. So, Hal, the cat's out of the bag, I said. He gave me a hard look. I guess there's wilder cats in it. It must come to this, George, I say. You mustn't tell madam, he adds. Good God, I cried. Do you mean that with fellows such as those I saw yonder, you and your friends are going to make fight against the greatest nation and the best army in the world? I guess we shall get an awful whipping, says Hal, and that's the fact. But then, George, he added, with his sweet kind smile, we are young, and a whipping or two may do us good. Won't it do us good, Dolly, you old slut? And he gives a playful touch with his whip to an old dog of all trades that was running by him. I did not try to urge upon him. I had done so in vain many times previously. Our British side of the question, the side which appears to me to be the best. He was accustomed to put off my reasons by saying, Almighty well, brother, you speak as an Englishman, and have cast in your lot with your country, as I have with mine. To this argument, I own, there is no answer, and all that remains for the disputants is to fight the matter out, when the strongest is in the right. Which had the right in the wars of the last century, the king or the parliament? The side that was uppermost was the right, and on the whole much more humane in their victory than the cavaliers would have been had they won. Nay, suppose we Tories had won the day in America, how frightful and bloody that triumph would have been! What ropes and scaffolds one imagines! What noble heads laid low! A strange feeling this, I own. I was on the loyalist side, and yet wanted the Whigs to win. My brother Hal, on the other hand, who distinguished himself greatly with his regiment, never allowed a word of disrespect against the enemy whom he opposed. The officers of the British Army, he used to say, are gentlemen, at least I have not heard that they are very much changed since my time. There may be scoundrels and ruffians amongst the enemy's troops. I dare say we could find some such amongst our own. Our business is to beat His Majesty's forces, not call them names. Any rascal can do that. And from a name which Mr. Lee gave my brother, and many of his rough horsemen did not understand, Harry was often called Chevalier Baird in the Continental Army. He was a knight indeed, without fear and without reproach. As for the argument, what could such people as those you were drilling do against the British army? Hal had as confident answer, They can beat them, says he. Mr. George, that's what they can do. Great heavens, I cry. Do you mean with your company of wolves you would hesitate to attack five hundred such? With my company of the 67th, I would go anywhere and agreed with you that at this present moment I know more of a soldiering than they. But place me on that open ground where you found us, armed as you please, and half a dozen of my friends with rifles, in the woods round about me, which would get the better? You know best, Mr. Braddock's aide-de-camp. There was no arguing with such a determination as this. Thou knowest my way of thinking, Hal, I said and having surprised you at your work, I must tell my lord what I have seen. Tell him, of course, you have seen our county militia exercising. You will see as much in every colony, from here to the St. Lawrence or Georgia. As I am an old soldier, they have elected me colonel. What more natural? Come, brother, let us trot on. Dinner will be ready, 
and Mrs. Fan does not like me to keep it waiting. And so we made for his house, which was open like all the houses of our Virginian gentlemen, and where not only every friend and neighbor, but every stranger and traveller was sure to find a welcome. So, Mrs. Fan, I said, I have found out what game my brother has been playing. I trust the Colonel will have plenty of sport ere long, says she, with a toss of her head. My wife thought Harry had been hunting, and I did not care to undeceive her, though what I had seen and he had told me made me naturally very anxious. End of chapter 88《Chapter 89 of the Virginians — This LibriVox recording is in the public domain — The Virginians by William Makepeace Thackeray — Chapter 89 — A Colonel Without a Regiment — When my visit to my brother was concluded, and my wife and young child had returned to our maternal house at Richmond, I made it my business to go over to our governor, then at his country house near Williamsburg, and confer with him regarding these open preparations for war, which were being made not only in our own province, but in every one of the colonies, as far as we could learn. Gentlemen with whose names history has since made all the world familiar were appointed from Virginia as delegates to the general congress about to be held in Philadelphia. In Massachusetts, the people and the royal troops were facing each other almost in open hostility. In Maryland and Pennsylvania we flattered ourselves that a much more loyal spirit was prevalent. In the Carolinas and Georgia the mother country could reckon upon staunch adherents and a great majority of the inhabitants, and it never was to be supposed that our own Virginia would forego its ancient loyalty. We had but few troops in the province, but its gentry were proud of their descent from the cavaliers of the old times and round about our governor were swarms of loud and confident loyalists, who were only eager for the moment when they might draw the sword and scatter the rascally rebels before them. Of course, in these meetings I was forced to hear many a hard word against my poor Harry. His wife all agreed, and not without good reason, perhaps, had led him to adopt these extreme anti-British opinions which he had of late declared and he was infatuated by his attachment to the gentlemen of mount vernon it was farther said whose opinions my brother always followed and who day by day was committing himself farther into the dreadful and desperate course of resistance this is your friend the people about his excellency said this is the man you favoured who has had your special confidence and who has repeatedly shared your hospitality it could not but be owned much of this was true, though what some of our eager loyalists called treachery was indeed rather a proof of the longing desire Mr. Washington and the other gentlemen had not to withdraw from their allegiance to the crown, but to remain faithful and exhaust the very last chance of reconciliation before they risked the other terrible alternative of revolt and separation. Let traitors arm, and villains draw the parricidal sword. We at least should remain faithful. The unconquerable power of England would be exerted, and the misguided and ungrateful provinces punished and brought back to their obedience. With what cheers we drank His Majesty's health after our banquets. We would die in defense of his rights. We would have a prince of his royal house to come and govern his ancient dominions. In consideration of my own and my excellent mother's loyalty, my brother's benighted conduct should be forgiven. Was it yet too late to secure him by offering him a good command? Would I not intercede with him who, it was known, had a great influence over him? In our Williamsburg councils we were alternately in every state of exultation and triumph, of hope, of fury against the rebels of anxious expectancy of home succor, of doubt, distrust, and gloom. I promised to intercede with my brother, and wrote to him, I own, with but little hope of success, repeating and trying to strengthen the arguments which I had many a time used in our conversations. 
My mother, too, used her authority, but from this, I own, I expected little advantage. She assailed him, as her habit was, with such texts of scripture as she thought bore out her own opinion, and threatened punishment to him. She menaced him with the penalties which must fall upon those who were disobedient to the powers that be. She pointed to his elder brother's example, and hinted, I fear, at his subjection to his wife, the very worst argument she could use in such a controversy. She did not show me her own letter to him. Possibly she knew I might find fault with the energy of some of the expressions she thought proper to employ. But she showed me his answer, from which I gathered what the style and tenor of the argument had been. And if Madame Esmond brought scripture to her aid, Mr. Hal, to my surprise, brought scores of texts to bear upon her in reply, and addressed her in a very neat, temperate, and even elegant composition, which I thought his wife herself was scarcely capable of penning. Indeed, I found he had enlisted the services of Mr. Bellman, the new Richmond clergyman, who had taken up strong opinions on the Whig side, and who preached and printed sermons against Hagen, who, as I have said, was of our faction, in which I fear Bellman had the best of the dispute. My exhortations to Hal had no more success than our mother's. He did not answer my letters. Being still farther pressed by the friends of the government, I wrote over most imprudently to say I would visit him at the end of the week at Fanny's Mount, but on arriving I only found my sister, who received me with perfect cordiality, but informed me that Hal was gone into the country, ever so far towards the Blue Mountains, to look at some horses, and was to be away she did not know how long he was to be away. I knew then there was no hope. My dear, I said, as far as I can judge from the signs of the times, the train that has been laid these years must have a match put to it before long. Harry is riding away. God knows to what end. The Lord prosper the righteous cause, Sir George, says she. Amen with all my heart. You and he speak as Americans. I, as an Englishman, tell him from me that when anything in the course of nature shall happen to our mother, I have enough for me and mine in England, and shall resign all our land here in Virginia to him. You don't mean that, George, she cries with brightening eyes. Well, to be sure, it is but right and fair, she presently added. Why should you, who are the eldest but by an hour, have everything? a palace and lands in England, the plantation here, the title, the children, and my poor Harry none. But tis generous of you all the same, leastways handsome and proper, and I didn't expect it of you. And you don't take after your mother in this, Sir George, that you don't know how. Give my love to Sister Theo, and she offers me a cheek to kiss, ere I ride away from her door. With such a woman as Fanny to guide him, how could I hope to make a convert of my brother? Having met with this poor success in my enterprise, I rode back to our governor with whom I agreed that it was time to arm in earnest, and prepare ourselves against the shock that certainly was at hand. He and his whole court of officials were not a little agitated and excited, needlessly savage, I thought, in their abuse of the wicked Whigs, and loud in their shouts of old England forever but they were all eager for the day when the contending parties could meet hand to hand and they could have an opportunity of riding those wicked wigs down. And I left my lord, having received the thanks of his excellency in council, and engaged to do my best endeavours to raise a body of men in defence of the crown. Hence the corps, called afterwards the Westmoreland Defenders, had its rise, of which I had the honour to be appointed colonel, and which I was to command when it appeared in the field. And that fortunate event must straightway take place so soon as the county knew that a gentleman of my station and name would take the command of the force. The announcement was duly made in the Government Gazette, and we filled in our officers readily enough. But the recruits, it must be owned, were slow to come in, and quick to disappear. Nevertheless, friend Hagen eagerly came forward to offer himself as chaplain. 
Madam Esmond gave us our colors and progressed about the country engaging volunteers. But the most eager recruiter of all was my good old tutor, little Mr. Dempster, who had been out as a boy on the Jacobite side in Scotland, and who went specially into the Carolinas among the children of his banished old comrades who had worn the white cockade of Prince Charles, and who, most of all, showed themselves in this contest still loyal to the crown. Hal's expedition in search of horses led him not only so far as the Blue Mountains in our colony, but thence on a long journey to Annapolis and Baltimore, and from Baltimore to Philadelphia, to be sure, where a second general congress was now sitting, attended by our Virginian gentlemen of the last year. Meanwhile, all the almanacs tell what had happened. Lexington had happened and the first shots were fired in the war which was to end in the independence of our native country. We still protested of our loyalty to his majesty, but we stated our determination to die or be free, and some twenty thousand of our loyal petitioners assembled round about Boston with arms in their hands and cannon to which they had helped themselves out of the government stores. Mr. Arnold had begun that career which was to end so brilliantly by the daring and burglarious capture of two forts of which he forced the doors. Three generals from Bond Street, with a large reinforcement, were on their way to help Mr. Gage out of his ugly position at Boston. Presently the armies were actually engaged, and our British generals commenced their career of conquest and pacification in the colonies by the glorious blunder of Breed's Hill. Here they fortified themselves, feeling themselves not strong enough for the moment to win any more glorious victories over the rebels. And the two armies lay watching each other, whilst Congress was deliberating at Philadelphia who should command the forces of the confederated colonies. We all know on whom the most fortunate choice of the nation fell. Of the Virginian regiment, which marched to join the new general-in-chief, one was commanded by Henry Esmond Warrington, Esquire, late a captain in His Majesty's service, and by his side rode his little wife, of whose bravery we often subsequently heard. I was glad, for one, that she had quitted Virginia, for had she remained after her husband's departure, our mother would infallibly have gone over to give her battle, and I was thankful, at least, that that incident of civil war was spared to our family in history. The rush of our farmers and country folk was almost all directed towards the new northern army, and our people were not a little flattered at the selection of a Virginian gentleman for the principal command. With a thrill of wrath and fury, the provinces heard of the blood drawn at Lexington, and men yelled denunciations against the cruelty and wantonness of the bloody British invader. The invader was but doing his duty, and was met and resisted by men in arms who wished to prevent him from helping himself to his own. But people do not stay to weigh their words when they mean to be angry. The colonists had taken their side, and with what I own to be a natural spirit and ardor, were determined to have a trial of strength with the braggart, domineering mother country. Breed's Hill became a mountain, as it were, which all men of the American continent might behold, with liberty, victory, glory on its flaming summit. Those dreaded troops could be withstood, then, by farmers and plowmen. These famous officers could be outgeneraled by doctors, lawyers, and civilians. Granted that Britons could conquer all the world. Here were their children who could match and conquer Britons. Indeed, I don't know which of the two deserves the palm, either the bravery or vainglory. We are in the habit of laughing at our French neighbors for boasting, gasconading, and so forth, but for a steady self-esteem and indomitable confidence in our own courage, greatness, magnanimity, who can compare with Britons, except their children across the Atlantic. The people round about us took the people's side for the most part in the struggle, and, truth to say, Sir George Warrington found his regiment of Westmoreland defenders but very thinly manned at the commencement, and woefully diminished in numbers presently, not only after the news of battle from the north, but in consequence of the behavior of my lord our governor, 
whose conduct enraged no one more than his own immediate partisans and the loyal adherents of the crown throughout the colony that he would plant the king's standard and summon all loyal gentlemen to rally round it had been a measure agreed in countless meetings and applauded over thousands of bumpers i have a pretty good memory and could mention the name of many a gentleman now a smug officer of the united states government whom i have heard hiccup out a prayer that he might be allowed to perish under the folds of his country's flag or roar a challenge to the bloody traitors absent with the rebel army but let bygones be bygones this however is matter of public history that his lordship our governor a peer of scotland the sovereign's representative in his old dominion who so loudly invited all the lieges to join the king's standard was the first to put it in his pocket and fly to his ships out of reach of danger he would not leave them save as a pirate at midnight to burn and destroy meanwhile we loyal gentry remained on shore committed to our cause and only subject to greater danger in consequence of the weakness and cruelty of him who ought to have been our leader it was the beginning of june our orchards and gardens were all blooming with plenty and summer a week before i had been over at williamsburg exchanging compliments with his excellency devising plans for future movements by which we should be able to make good head against rebellion shaking hands heartily at parting and vincere ut morti the very last words upon all our lips our little family was gathered at richmond talking over as we did daily the prospect of affairs in the north the quarrels between our own assembly and his excellency by whom they had been afresh convened when our ghostly hagen rushes into the parlour and asks have we heard the news of the governor has he dissolved the assembly again and put that scoundrel patrick henry in irons asks madam esmond no such thing his lordship with his lady and family have left their palace privately at night they are on board a man-of-war off york whence my lord has sent a dispatch to the assembly begging them to continue their sitting and announcing that he himself had only quitted his government house out of fear of the fury of the people what was to become of the sheep now the shepherd had run away no entreaties could be more pathetic than those of the gentlemen of the house of assembly who guaranteed their governor security if he would but land and implored him to appear amongst them if but to pass bills and transact the necessary business no the man of war was his seat of government and my lord desired his house of commons to wait upon him there this was erecting the king's standard with a vengeance our governor had left us our assembly perforce ruled in his stead a rabble of people followed the fugitive viceroy on board his ships a mob of negroes deserted out of the plantations to join this other deserter he and his black allies landed here and there in darkness and emulated the most lawless of our opponents in their alacrity at seizing and burning he not only invited runaway negroes but he sent an ambassador to indians with entreaties to join his standard when he came on shore it was to burn and destroy when the people resisted as at norfolk and hampton he retreated and betook himself to his ships again even my mother after that miserable flight of our chief was scared at the aspect of affairs and doubted of the speedy putting down of the rebellion the arming of the negroes was in her opinion the most cowardly blow of all the loyal gentry were ruined and robbed many of them of their only property a score of our worst hands deserted from richmond and castlewood and fled to our courageous governor's fleet not all of them though some of them were slain and a couple hung by the enemy for plunder and robbery perpetrated whilst with his lordship's precious army because her property was wantonly injured and his majesty's chief officer an imbecile would madame esmond desert the cause of royalty and honour my good mother was never so prodigiously dignified and loudly and enthusiastically loyal as after she heard of our governor's lamentable defection. 
The people round about her, though most of them of quite a different way of thinking, listened to her speeches without unkindness. Her oddities were known far and wide through our province, where, I am afraid, many of the wags amongst our young men were accustomed to smoke her, as the phrase then was, and draw out her stories about the Marquis, her father, and the splendor of her family, and so forth. But, along with her oddities, her charities and kindness were remembered, and many a rebel, as she called them, had a sneaking regard for the pompous little Tory lady. As for the Colonel of the Westmoreland Defenders, though that gentleman's command dwindled utterly away after the outrageous conduct of his chief, yet I escaped some very serious danger which might have befallen me and mine in consequence of some disputes which I was known to have had with my Lord Dunmore. Going on board his ship after he had burned the stores at Hampton, and issued the proclamation calling the Negroes to his standard, I made so free as to remonstrate with him in regard to both measures. I implored him to return to Williamsburg, where hundreds of us, thousands, I hoped, would be ready to defend him to the last extremity, and in my remonstrance used terms so free, or rather, as I suspect, indicated my contempt for his conduct so clearly by my behavior, that his lordship flew into a rage, said I was a rebel like all the rest of them, and ordered me under arrest there on board his own ship. In my quality of militia officer, since the breaking out of the troubles I commonly used a red coat to show that I wore the king's color, I begged for a court-martial immediately, and turning round to two officers who had been present during our altercation, desired them to remember all that had passed between his lordship and me. These gentlemen were no doubt of my way of thinking as to the chief's behavior, and our interview ended in my going ashore unaccompanied by a guard. The story got wind amongst the Whig gentry, and was improved in the telling. I had spoken out my mind manfully to the governor. No Whig could have uttered sentiments more liberal. When riots took place in Richmond, and of the Loyalists remaining there, many were in peril of life, and betook themselves to the ships, my mother's property and house were never endangered, nor her family insulted. We were still at the stage when a reconciliation was fondly thought possible. Ah, if all the Tories were like you, a distinguished Whig has said to me, we and the people at home should soon come together again. This, of course, was before the famous Fourth of July, and that declaration which rendered reconcilement impossible. Afterwards, when parties grew more rancorous, motives much less creditable were assigned for my conduct, and it was said I chose to be a liberal Tory, because I was a cunning fox, and wished to keep my estate whatever way things went. And this, I am bound to say, is the opinion regarding my humble self which has obtained in very high quarters at home, where a profound regard for my own interest has been supposed not uncommonly to have occasioned my conduct during the late unhappy troubles. There were two or three persons in the world, for I had not told my mother how I was resolved to cede to my brother all my life interest in our American property, who knew that I had no mercenary motives in regard to the conduct I pursued. It was not worth while to undeceive others. What were life worth if a man were forced to feel himself a la piste of all the calumnies uttered against him? And I do not quite know to this present day how it happened that my mother, that notorious loyalist, was left for several years quite undisturbed in her house at Castlewood, a stray troop or company of Continentals being occasionally quartered upon her. I do not know for certain, I say, how this piece of good fortune happened, though I can give a pretty shrewd guess as to the cause of it. Madame Fanny, after a campaign before Boston, came back to Fanny's mount, leaving her colonel. My modest Hal, until the conclusion of the war, would accept no higher rank, believing that in command of a regiment he could be more useful than in charge of a division. Madame Fanny, I say, came back, and it was remarkable after her return how her old asperity towards my mother seemed to be removed, and what an affection she showed for her and all the property. 
she was great friends with the governor and some of the most influential gentlemen of the new assembly. Madame Esmond was harmless, and for her son's sake, who was bravely battling for his country, her errors should be lightly visited. I know not how it was, but for years she remained unharmed, except in respect of heavy government requisitions, which of course she had to pay, and it was not until the redcoats appeared about our house that much serious evil came to it. End of chapter 89「Chapter Ninety of the Virginians This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Virginians by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter Ninety In which we both fight and run away. What was the use of a colonel without a regiment? The governor and council, who had made such a parade of thanks in endowing me with mine, were away out of sight, skulking on board ships with an occasional piracy and arson on shore. My Lord Dunmore's black allies frightened away those of his own blood. And besides these negroes whom he had summoned round him in arms, we heard that he had sent an envoy among the Indians of the South, and that they were to come down in numbers and tomahawk our people into good behavior. "'And these are to be our allies,' I said to my mother, exchanging ominous looks with her and remembering with a ghastly distinctness that savage whose face glared over mine and whose knife was at my throat when Florax struck him down on Braddock's field. We put our house of Castlewood into as good a state of defense as we could devise. But in truth it was more of the red men and the blacks than of the rebels we were afraid. I never saw my mother lose courage but once and then when she was recounting to us the particulars of our father's death in a foray of indians more than forty years ago seeing some figures one night moving in front of our house nothing could persuade the good lady but that they were savages and she sank on her knees crying out the lord have mercy upon us the indians the indians my lord's negro allies vanished on board his ships or where they could find pay and plunder. But the painted heroes from the South never made their appearance, though I own to have looked at my mother's gray head, my wife's brown hair, and our little one's golden ringlets with a horrible pang of doubt, lest these should fall the victims of ruffian war. And it was we who fought with such weapons, and enlisted these allies. But that I dare not, so to speak, be setting myself up as interpreter of providence, and pointing out the special finger of heaven, as many people are wont to do, I would say our employment of these Indians and of the German mercenaries brought their own retribution with them in this war. In the field, where the mercenaries were attacked by the provincials, they yielded, and it was triumphing over them that so raised the spirit of the Continental Army and the murder of one woman, Miss McCrae, by a half-dozen drunken Indians, did more harm to the royal cause than the loss of a battle or the destruction of regiments. Now the Indian panic over, Madame Esmond's courage returned, and she began to be seriously and not unjustly uneasy at the danger which I ran myself, and which I brought upon others by remaining in Virginia. "'What harm can they do to me?' says she, a poor woman. If I have one son, a colonel, without a regiment, I have another with a couple of hundred continentals behind him in Mr. Washington's camp. If the royalists come, they will let me off for your sake. If the rebels appear, I shall have Harry's passport. I don't wish, sir, I don't like that your delicate wife and this dear little baby should be here, and only increase the risk of all of us. We must have them away to Boston or New York. Don't talk about defending me. Who will think of hurting a poor harmless old woman? If the rebels come, I shall shelter behind Mrs. Fanny's petticoats, and shall be much safer without you in the house than in it. This she said in part, perhaps, because t'was reasonable, more so because she would have me and my family out of the danger, and danger or not, for her part, felt that she was determined to remain in the land where her father was buried and she was born. She was living backwards, so to speak, 
she had seen the new generation and blessed them and bade them farewell. She belonged to the past and old days and memories. While we were debating about the Boston scheme, comes the news that the British have evacuated that luckless city altogether, never having ventured to attack Mr. Washington in his camp at Cambridge, though he lay there for many months without powder at our mercy. But waiting until he procured ammunition, and seized and fortified Dorchester Heights, which commanded the town, out of which the whole British army and colony was obliged to beat a retreat. That the king's troops won the battle at Bunker Hill, there is no more doubt than that they beat the French at Blenheim. But through the war their chiefs seem constantly to have been afraid of assaulting entrenched continentals afterwards, else why, from July to March, hesitate to strike an almost defenseless enemy? Why the hesitation at Long Island? when the Continental Army was in our hand. Why that astonishing timorousness of Howe before Valley Forge, where the relics of a force starving, sickening, and in rags could scarcely man the lines, which they held before a great, victorious, and perfectly appointed army. As the hopes and fears of the contending parties rose and fell, it was curious to mark the altered tone of the partisans of either. When the news came to us in the country of the evacuation of Boston, every little Whig in the neighborhood made his bow to Madam and advised her to a speedy submission. She did not carry her loyalty quite so openly as heretofore and flaunt her flag in the faces of the public, but she never swerved. Every night and morning in private poor Hagen prayed for the royal family in our own household and on Sundays any neighbors were welcome to attend the service where my mother acted as a very emphatic clerk, and the prayer for the High Court of Parliament under our most religious and gracious king was very stoutly delivered. The brave Hagen was a parson without a living, as I was a militia colonel without a regiment. Hagen had continued to pray stoutly for King George in Williamsburg long after His Excellency our Governor had run away. But on coming to church one Sunday to perform his duty, he found a corporal's guard at the church door, who told him that the committee of safety had put another divine in his place, and he was requested to keep a quiet tongue in his head. He told the men to lead them before their chiefs. Our honest friend always loved tall words and tragic attitudes and accordingly was marched through the streets to the capital with a chorus of white and colored blackguards at the skirts of his gown, and had an interview with Messrs. Henry and the new state officers, and confronted the robbers, as he said, in their den. Of course he was for making an heroic speech before these gentlemen, and was one of many men who perhaps would have no objection to be made martyrs, so that they might be roasted corum populo were tortured in a full house. But Mr. Henry was determined to give him no such chance. After keeping Hagen three or four hours waiting in an anteroom in the company of Negroes, when the worthy divine entered the new chief magistrate's room with an undaunted mien, and began a prepared speech with, Sir, by what authority am I a minister of the... Mr. Hagen, says the other, interrupting him, I am too busy to listen to speeches. And as for King George, he has henceforth no more authority in this country than King Nebuchadnezzar. Mind you that, and hold your tongue, if you please. Stick to King John, sir, and King Macbeth. And if you will send round your benefit tickets, all the assembly shall come and hear you. Did you ever see Mr. Hagen on the boards when you was in London, General? And so saying, Henry turns round upon Mr. Washington's second in command, General Lee, who was now come into Virginia upon state affairs, and our shamefaced good Hagen was bustled out of the room, reddening, and almost crying with shame. After this event we thought that Hagen's ministrations were best confined to us in the country, and removed the worthy pastor from his rest of lambs in the city. The selection of Virginians to the very highest civil and military appointments of the new government bribed and flattered many of our leading people who otherwise, and but for the outrageous conduct of our government, might have remained faithful to the crown, and made good head against the rising rebellion. 
but although we loyalists were gagged and muzzled though the capital was in the hands of the whigs and our vaunted levies of loyal recruits so many falstaff's regiments for the most part the faithful still kept intelligences with one another in the colony and with our neighbors and though we did not rise and though we ran away and though in examination before committees justices and so forth some of our frightened people gave themselves republican airs and vowed perdition to kings and nobles yet we knew each other pretty well and according as the chances were more or less favorable to us the master more or less hard we concealed our colors showed our colors half showed our colors or downright apostatized for the nonce and cried down with king george our negroes bore about from house to house all sorts of messages and tokens endless underhand plots and schemes were engaged in by those who could not afford the light the battle over the neutrals come and join the winning side and shout as loudly as the patriots the runaways are not counted will any man tell me that the signers and ardent well-wishers of the declaration of independence were not in a minority of the nation and that the minority did not win we knew that a part of the defeated army of massachusetts was about to make an important expedition southward upon the success of which the very greatest hopes were founded and i for one being anxious to make a movement as soon as there was any chance of activity had put myself in communication with the ex-governor martin of north carolina whom i proposed to join with three or four of our virginian gentlemen officers of that notable corps of which we only wanted privates we made no particular mystery about our departure from castlewood the affairs of congress were not going so well yet that the new government could afford to lay any particular stress or tyranny upon persons of a doubtful way of thinking gentlemen's houses were still open and in our southern fashion we would visit our friends for months at a time my wife and i with our infant and a fitting suite of servants took leave of madame esmond on a visit to a neighboring plantation we went thence to another friend's house and then to another till finally we reached wilmington in north carolina which was the point at which we expected to stretch a hand to the suckers which were coming to meet us ere our arrival our brother carolinian royalists had shown themselves in some force their encounters with the whigs had been unlucky the poor highlanders had been no more fortunate in their present contest in favor of king george than when they had drawn their swords against him in their own country we did not reach wilmington until the end of may by which time we found admiral parker's squadron there with general clinton and five british regiments on board whose object was a descent upon charleston the general to whom i immediately made myself known seeing that my regiment consisted of lady warrington our infant whom she was nursing and three negro servants received us at first with a very grim welcome but captain horner of the sphinx frigate who had been on the jamaica station and received like all the rest of the world many kindnesses from our dear governor there when he heard that my wife was general lambert's daughter eagerly received her on board and gave up his best cabin to our service and so we were refugees too like my lord dunmore having waved our flag to be sure and pocketed it and slipped out at the back door from wilmington we bore away quickly to charleston and in the course of the voyage and our delay in the river previous to our assault on the place i made some acquaintance with mr clinton which increased to a further intimacy it was the king's birthday when we appeared in the river we determined it was a glorious day for the commencement of the expedition. It did not take place for some days after, and I leave out purposely all descriptions of my Penelope parting from her Hector, going forth on this expedition. In the first place, Hector is perfectly well, though a little gouty, nor has any rascal of a Pyrrhus made a prize of his widow, and in times of war and commotion, are not such scenes of woe and terror and parting occurring every hour 
I can see the gentle face yet over the bulwark as we descend the ship's side into the boats and the smile of the infant on her arm. What old stories, to be sure! Captain Miles, having no natural taste for poetry, you have forgot the verses, no doubt, in Mr. Pope's Homer, in which you are described as parting with your heroic father. But your mother often read them to you as a boy, and keeps the gorget I wore on that day somewhere amongst her dressing-boxes now. My second venture at fighting was no more lucky than my first. We came back to our ships that evening thoroughly beaten. The madcap Lee, whom Clinton had faced at Boston, now met him at Charleston. Lee and the gallant garrison there made a brilliant and most successful resistance. The fort on Sullivan's Island, which we attacked, was a nut we could not crack. The fire of all our frigates was not strong enough to pound its shell. The passage by which we moved up to the assault of the place was not fordable, as those officers found, Sir Henry at the head of them, who was always the first to charge, who attempted to wade it. Death by shot, by drowning, by catching my death of cold, I had braved before I returned to my wife, and our frigate, being aground for a time, and got off with difficulty, was agreeably cannonaded by the enemy until she got off her bank. A small incident in the midst of this unlucky struggle was the occasion of a subsequent intimacy which arose between me and Sir Harry Clinton, and bound me to that most gallant officer during the period in which it was my fortune to follow the war. Of his qualifications as leader there may be many opinions. I fear to say, regarding a man I heartily respect and admire, there ought to be only one. Of his personal bearing and his courage there can be no doubt. He was always eager to show it, and whether at the final charge on Breed's Hill, when at the head of the rallied troops he carried the Continental lines, or here before Sullivan's Fort, or a year later at Fort Washington, when, standard in hand, he swept up the height and entered the fort at the head of the storming column, Clinton was always foremost in the race of battle, and the King's service knew no more admirable soldier. We were taking to the water from our boats with the intention of forcing the column to the fort through a way which our own guns had rendered practicable, when a shot struck a boat alongside of us, so well aimed as actually to put three-fourths of the boat's crew hors de combat, and knocked down the officer steering and the flag behind him. I could not help crying out, Bravo! Well aimed! for no ninepins ever went down more helplessly than these poor fellows before the round shot. Then the general, turning round to me, says rather grimly, Sir, the behavior of the enemy seems to please you. I am pleased, sir, says I, that my countrymen yonder should fight as becomes our nation. We floundered on towards the fort, in the midst of the same amiable attentions from small arms and great, until we found the water was up to our breasts and deepening at every step, when we were fain to take to our boats again and pull out of harm's way. Sir Henry waited upon my Lady Warrington on board the Sphinx after this, and was very gracious to her, and mighty facetious regarding the character of the humble writer of the present memoir, whom His Excellency always described as a rebel at heart. I pray my children may live to see or engage in no great revolutions, such as that, for instance, raging in the country of our miserable French neighbors. Save a very, very few indeed, the actors in those great tragedies do not bear to be scanned too closely. The chiefs are often no better than ranting quacks, the heroes in noble puppets, the heroines anything but pure. The prize is not always to the brave. In our revolution it certainly did fall, for once and for a wonder, to the most deserving, but who knows his enemies now? His great and surprising triumphs were not in those rare engagements with the enemy where he obtained a trifling mastery, but over Congress, over hunger and disease, over lukewarm friends or smiling foes in his own camp, whom his great spirit had to meet and master. When the struggle was over, and our important chiefs who had conducted it 
began to squabble and accuse each other in their own defence before the nation. What charges and countercharges were brought, what pretexts of delay were urged, what piteous excuses were put forward that this fleet arrived too late, that that regiment mistook its orders, that these cannonballs would not fit those guns, and so to the end of the chapter. Here was a general who beat us with no shot at times, and no powder, and no money, and he never thought of a convention. His courage never capitulated. Through all the doubt and darkness, the danger and long tempests of the war, I think it was only the American leader's indomitable soul that remained entirely steady. Of course, our Charleston expedition was made the most of and pronounced a prodigious victory by the enemy, who had learnt, from their parents perhaps, to cry victory if a corporal's guard were surprised, as loud as if we had won a pitched battle. Mr. Lee rushed back to New York, the conqueror of conquerors, trumpeting his glory, and by no man received with more eager delight than by the commander-in-chief of the American army. It was my dear Lee and my dear general between them, then, and it hath always touched me in the history of our early revolution to note that simple confidence and admiration with which the general-in-chief was wont to regard officers under him who had happened previously to serve with the king's army. So the Mexicans of old looked and wondered when they first saw an armed Spanish horseman. And this mad, flashy braggart, and another continental general whose name and whose luck afterwards were sufficiently notorious, you may be sure, took advantage of the modesty of the commander-in-chief, and advised, and blustered, and sneered, and disobeyed orders, daily presenting fresh obstacles, as if he had not enough otherwise, in the path over which only Mr. Washington's astonishing endurance could have enabled him to march. Whilst we were away on our South Carolina expedition, the famous Fourth of July had taken place, and we and the thirteen United States were parted forever. My own native state of Virginia had also distinguished itself by announcing that all men are equally free, that all power is vested in the people who have an inalienable right to alter, reform, or abolish their form of government at pleasure, and that the idea of an hereditary first magistrate is unnatural and absurd. Our general presented me with this document fresh from Williamsburg, as we were sailing northward by the Virginia Capes, and amidst not a little amusement and laughter, pointed out to me the faith to which, from the fourth instruction inclusive, I was bound. There was no help for it. I was a Virginian. My godfathers had promised and vowed in my name that all men were equally free, including, of course, the race of poor Gumbo that the idea of a monarchy is absurd, and that I had the right to alter my form of government at pleasure. I thought of Madame Esmond at home, and how she would look when these articles of faith were brought her to subscribe. How would Hagen receive them? He demolished them in a sermon, in which all the logic was on his side. But the U.S. government has not somehow been affected by the discourse. And when he came to touch upon the point that all men being free— Therefore Gumbo and Sadie and Nathan had assuredly a right to go to Congress. "'Tut, tut, my good Mr. Hagen,' says my mother. "'Let us hear no more of this nonsense, but leave such wickedness and folly to the rebels.' By the middle of August we were before New York, whither Mr. Howe had brought his army that had betaken itself to Halifax after its inglorious expulsion from Boston. The American commander-in-chief was at New York, and a great battle inevitable, and I looked forward to it with an inexpressible feeling of doubt and anxiety, knowing that my dearest brother and his regiment formed part of the troops whom we must attack, and could not but overpower. Almost the whole of the American army came over to fight on the small island, where every officer on both sides knew that they were to be beaten, and whence they had not a chance of escape. Two frigates, out of a hundred we had placed so as to command the enemy's entrenched camp and point of retreat across East River to New York, 
would have destroyed every bark in which he sought to fly, and compelled him to lay down his arms on shore. He fought. His hasty levies were utterly overthrown. Some of his generals, his best troops, his artillery taken. The remnant huddled into their entrenched camp after their rout, the pursuers entering it with them. The victors were called back. The enemy was then pent up in a corner of the island and could not escape. They are at our mercy and are ours tomorrow, says the gentle general. Not a ship was set to watch the American force. Not a sentinel of ours could see a movement in their camp. A whole army crossed under our eyes in one single night to the mainland, without the loss of a single man. And General Howe was suffered to remain in command after this feat, and to complete his glories of Long Island and Breed's Hill at Philadelphia. A friend, to be sure, crossed in the night to say the enemy's army was being ferried over, but he fell upon a picket of Germans. They could not understand him. Their commander was boozing or asleep. In the morning, when the spy was brought to someone who could comprehend the American language, the whole continental force had crossed the East River, and the empire over thirteen colonies had slipped away. The opinions I had about our chief were by no means uncommon in the army, though perhaps wisely kept secret by gentlemen under Mr. Howe's immediate command. Am I more unlucky than other folks, I wonder? Or why are my imprudent sayings carried about more than my neighbors? My rage that such a use was made of such a victory was no greater than that of scores of gentlemen with the army. Why must my name forsooth be given up to the commander-in-chief as that of the most guilty of the grumblers? Personally, General Howe was perfectly brave, amiable, and good-humored. So, Sir George, says he, you find fault with me as a military man, because there was a fog after the battle on Long Island, and your friends, the Continentals, gave me the slip. Surely we took and killed enough of them, but there is no satisfying you gentlemen amateurs. And he turned his back on me and shrugged his shoulders and talked to someone else. Amateur I might be, and he the most amiable of men, but if King George had said to him, Never more be officer of mine, yonder agreeable and pleasant Cassio would most certainly have had his desert. I soon found how our chief had come in possession of his information regarding myself. My admirable cousin, Mr. William Esmond, who of course had forsaken New York and his post when all the royal authorities fled out of the place and Washington occupied it, returned along with our troops and fleets, and, being a gentleman of good birth and name and well acquainted with the city, made himself agreeable to the newcomers of the royal army, the young bloods, merry fellows, and macaronis, by introducing them to play-tables, taverns, and yet worse places, with which the worthy gentleman continued to be familiar in the new world as in the old. Coelum non animum, however Will had changed his air, or whithersoever he transported his carcass, he carried a rascal in his skin. I had heard a dozen stories of his sayings regarding my family, and was determined neither to avoid him nor seek him, but to call him to account whenever we met. And chancing one day to be at a coffee-house in a friend's company, my worthy kinsman swaggered in with a couple of young lads of the army, whom he found it was his pleasure and profit now to lead into every kind of dissipation. I happened to know one of Mr. Will's young companions, an aide-de-camp of General Clinton's, who had been in my close company both at Charleston, before Sullivan's Island, and in the action of Brooklyn, where our general gloriously led the right wing of the English army. They took a box without noticing us at first, though I heard my name three or four times mentioned by my brawling kinsman, who ended some drunken speech he was making by slapping his fist on the table and swearing, by God, I will do for him, and the bloody rebel, his brother. Ah, Mr. Esmond, says I, coming forward with my hat on. He looked a little pale behind his punch bowl. I have long waited to see you, to set some little matters right about which there has been a difference between us. And what may those be, sir? says he, with a volley of oaths. 
You have chosen to cast a doubt upon my courage, and say that I shirked a meeting with you when we were young men. Our relationship and our age ought to prevent us from having recourse to such murderous follies. Mr. Will started up, looking fierce and relieved. But I give you notice that though I can afford to overlook lies against myself, if I hear from you a word in disparagement of my brother, Colonel Warrington, of the Continental Army, I will hold you accountable. Indeed, gentlemen, mighty fine indeed. You take notice of Sir George Warrington's words, cries Mr. Will over his punch bowl. You have been pleased to say, I continue, growing angry as I spoke, and being a fool, therefore, for my pains, that the very estates we hold in this country are not ours, but of right revert to your family. So they are ours. By George, they're ours! I've heard my brother Castlewood say so a score of times, swears Mr. Will. In that case, sir, says I hotly, your brother, my Lord Castlewood, tells no more truth than yourself. We have the titles at home in Virginia. They are registered in the courts there, and if ever I hear one word more of this impertinence, I shall call you to account where no constables will be at hand to interfere. I wonder, cries Will in a choking voice, that I don't cut him into twenty thousand pieces as he stands there before me with his confounded yellow face. It was my brother Castlewood won his money. No, it was his brother. Damn you, which are you, the rebel or the other? I hate the ugly faces of both of you, and <laughs> if you were for the king, show you were for the king, and drink his health. And he sank down into his box with a hiccup and a wild laugh, which he repeated a dozen times with a hundred more oaths and vociferous outcries that I should drink the king's health. To reason with a creature in this condition, or ask explanations or apologies from him was absurd. I left Mr. Will to reel to his lodgings under the care of his young friends, who were surprised to find an old toper so suddenly affected and so utterly prostrated by liquor, and limped home to my wife, whom I found happy in possession of a brief letter from Hal, which a countryman had brought in, and who said not a word about the affairs of the Continentals with whom he was engaged, but wrote a couple of pages of rapturous eulogiums upon his brother's behavior in the field, which my dear Hal was pleased to admire, as he admired everything I said and did. I rather looked for a messenger from my amiable kinsman, in consequence of the speeches which had passed between us the night before, and did not know but that I might be called by will to make my words good. And when accordingly Mr. Lacey, our companion of the previous evening, made his appearance at an early hour of the forenoon, I was beckoning my Lady Warrington to leave us, when, with a laugh and a cry of, Oh, oh no, dear, no, Mr. Lacey begged her ladyship not to disturb herself. I have seen, says he, a gentleman who begs to send you his apologies if he uttered a word last night which could offend you. What apologies? What words? asks the anxious wife. I explained that roaring Will Esmond had met me in a coffee-house on the previous evening, and quarrelled with me, as he had done with hundreds before. It appears the fellow is constantly abusive, and invariably pleads drunkenness, and apologizes the next morning, unless he is caned overnight, remarked Captain Lacey. And my lady, I dare say, makes a little sermon, and asks why we gentlemen will go to idle coffee-houses, and run the risk of meeting roaring, roistering Will Esmonds. Our sojourn in New York was enlivened by a project for burning the city which some ardent patriots entertained and partially executed. Several such schemes were laid in the course of the war, and each one of the principal cities was doomed to fire, though in the interests of peace and goodwill, I hope it will be remembered that these plans never originated with the cruel government of a tyrant king, but were always proposed by gentlemen on the continental side, who vowed that, rather than remain under the ignominious despotism of the ruffian of Brunswick, the fairest towns of America should burn. 
I presume that the sages who were for burning down Boston were not actual proprietors in that place, and the New York burners might come from other parts of the country, from Philadelphia or what not. Howbeit, the British spared you, gentlemen, and we pray you give us credit for this act of moderation. I had not the fortune to be present in the action on the White Plains, being detained by the hurt which I had received at Long Island, and which broke out again and again, and took some time in the healing. The tenderest of nurses watched me through my tedious malady, and was eager for the day when I should doff my militia coat and return to the quiet English home where Hetty and our good general were tending our children. Indeed, I don't know that I have yet forgiven myself for the pains and terrors that I must have caused my poor wife by keeping her separate from her young ones and away from her home, because, forsooth, I wish to see a little more of the war than going on. Our grand tour in Europe had been all very well. We had beheld St. Peter's at Rome and the bishop thereof, the doffiness of France, alas to think that glorious head should ever have been brought so low at paris and the rightful king of england at florence i had dipped my gout in a half dozen baths and spas and played cards in a hundred courts as my travels in europe which i propose to publish after my completion of the history of the american war will testify Neither of these two projected works of Sir George Warrington were brought, as it appears, to completion. And during our peregrinations, my hypochondria diminished, which plagued me woefully at home, and my health and spirits visibly improved. Perhaps it was because she saw the evident benefit I had from excitement and change that my wife was reconciled to my continuing to enjoy them and though secretly suffering pangs at being away from her nursery and her eldest boy, for whom she ever has had an absurd infatuation, the dear hypocrite scarce allowed a look of anxiety to appear on her face, encouraged me with smiles, professed herself eager to follow me, asked why it should be a sin in me to covet honour, and, in a word, was ready to stay, to go, to smile, to be sad, to scale mountains, or to go down to the sea in ships, to say that cold was pleasant, heat tolerable, hunger good sport, dirty lodgings delightful, though she is wretched sailor, very delicate about the little she eats, and an extreme sufferer both of cold and heat. Hence, as I willed to stay on yet a while on my native continent, she was certain nothing was so good for me, and when I was minded to return home, oh, how she brightened and kissed her infant, and told him how he should see the beautiful gardens at home, and Aunt Theo, and Grandpapa, and his sister, and Miles. Miles! cries the little parrot, mocking its mother, and crowing, as if there was any mighty privilege in seeing Mr. Miles, forsooth who was under Dr. Sumner's care at Harrow-on-the-Hill, where, to do the gentleman justice, he showed that he could eat more tarts than any boy in the school, and took most creditable prizes at football and hare and hounds. End of chapter 90「ニトリ」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Virginians by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter 91 Satis Pugnae. It has always seemed to me, I speak under the correction of military gentlemen, that the entrenchments of Breed's Hill serve the Continental Army throughout the whole of our American war. The slaughter inflicted upon us from behind those lines was so severe, and the behavior of the enemy so resolute, that the British chiefs respected the barricades of the Americans hereafter. And were they firing from behind a row of blankets, certain of our generals rather hesitated to force them. In the affair of the White Plains, when, for a second time, Mr. Washington's army was quite at the mercy of the victors, 
We subsequently heard that our conquering troops were held back before a barricade actually composed of cornstalks and straw. Another opportunity was given us, and lasted during a whole winter, during which the dwindling and dismayed troops of Congress lay starving and unarmed under our grasp, and the magnanimous Mr. Howe left the famous camp of Valley Forge untouched, whilst his great, brave, and perfectly appointed army fiddled and gambled and feasted in Philadelphia. And by Bing's countrymen, triumphal arches were erected, tournaments were held in pleasant mockery of the Middle Ages, and wreaths and garlands offered by beautiful ladies to this clement chief, with fantastical mottoes and posies announcing that his laurels should be immortal. Why have my ungrateful countrymen in America never erected statues to this general? They had not in all their army an officer who fought their battles better, who enabled them to retrieve their errors with such adroitness who took care that their defeats should be so little hurtful to themselves. And when, in the course of events, the stronger force naturally got the uppermost, who showed such an untiring tenderness, patience, and complacency in helping the poor disabled opponent on to his legs again? Ah, think of eighteen years before, and the firing young warrior whom England had sent out to fight her adversary on the American continent. Fancy him forever pacing round the defences behind which the foe lies sheltered. By night and by day alike sleepless and eager, consuming away in his fierce wrath and longing, and never closing his eye, so intent is it in watching, winding the track with untiring scent that pants and hungers for blood and battle, prowling through midnight forests, or climbing silent over precipices before dawn, and watching till his great heart is almost worn out, until the foe shows himself at last, when he springs on him and grapples with him, and dying, slays him. Think of Wolfe at Quebec, and hearken to Howe's fiddles, as he sits smiling amongst the dancers at Philadelphia. A favorite scheme with our ministers at home and some of our generals in America was to establish a communication between Canada and New York, by which means it was hoped New England might be cut off from the neighboring colonies, overpowered in detail and forced into submission. Burgoyne was entrusted with the conduct of the plan, and he set forth from Quebec, confidently promising to bring it to a successful issue. His march began in military state. The trumpets of his proclamations blew before him. He bade the colonists to remember the immense power of England, and summoned the misguided rebels to lay down their arms. He brought with him a formidable English force, an army of German veterans not less powerful, a dreadful band of Indian warriors, and a brilliant train of artillery. It was supposed that the people round his march would rally to the royal cause and standards. The continental force in front of him was small at first, and Washington's army was weakened by the withdrawal of troops who were hurried forward to meet this Canadian invasion. A British detachment from New York was to force its way up the Hudson, sweeping away the enemy on the route, and make a junction with Burgoyne at Albany. This was the time when Washington's weakened army should have been struck too, but a greater power willed otherwise. Nor am I, for one, even going to regret the termination of the war. As we look over the game now, how clear seem the blunders which were made by the losing side. From the beginning to the end, we were forever arriving too late. Our supplies and reinforcements from home were too late. Our troops were in difficulty, and our suckers reached them too late. Our fleet appeared off Yorktown just too late, after Cornwallis had surrendered. A way of escape was open to Burgoyne, but he resolved upon retreat too late. I have heard discomfited officers in after days prove infallibly how a different wind would have saved America to us, how we must have destroyed the French fleet 
but for a tempest or two how once twice thrice but for nightfall mr washington and his army were in our power who has not speculated in the course of his reading of history upon the has been and the might have been in the world i take my tattered old map book from the shelf and see the board on which the great contest was played i wonder at the curious chances which lost it and putting aside any idle talk about the respect or bravery of the two nations can't but see that we had the best cards and that we lost the game i own the sport had a considerable fascination for me and stirred up my languid blood my brother hal when settled on his plantation in virginia was perfectly satisfied with the sports and occupations he found there the company of the country neighbors sufficed him he never tired of looking after his crops and people taking his fish shooting his ducks hunting in the woods or enjoying his rubber and his supper happy hal in his great barn of a house under his roomy porches his dogs lying round his feet his friends the virginian will wimbles at free quarters in his mansion his negroes fat lazy and ragged his shrewd little wife ruling over them and her husband who always obeyed her implicitly when living and who was pretty speedily consoled when she died i say happy though his lot would have been intolerable to me wife and friends and plantation and town life at richmond richmond succeeded to the honor of being the capital when our province became a state how happy he whose foot fits the shoe which fortune gives him my income was five times as great my house in england as large and built of bricks and faced with freestone my wife would i have changed her for any other wife in the world my children well i am contented with my lady warrington's opinion about them but with all these plums and peaches and rich fruits out of plenty's horn poured into my lap i fear i have been but an ingrate and hodge my gatekeeper who shares his bread and scrap of bacon with a family as large as his master's seems to me to enjoy his meal as much as i do though mrs molly prepares her best dishes and sweetmeats and mr gumbo uncorks the choicest bottle from the cellar ah me sweetmeats have lost their savour for me however they may rejoice my young ones from the nursery and the perfume of claret palls upon old noses our parson has poured out his sermons many and many a time to me and perhaps i did not care for them much when he first broached them dost thou remember honest friend sure he does for he has repeated the story over the bottle as many times as his sermons almost and my lady warrington pretends as if she had never heard it i say joe blake thou rememberst full well and with advantages that october evening when we scrambled up an embrasure at fort clinton and a clubbed musket would have dashed those valuable brains out had not joe's sword whipped my rebellious countrymen through the gizzard joe wore a red coat in those days the uniform of the brave sixty-third whose leader the bold sill fell pierced with many wounds beside him he exchanged his red for black and my pulpit his doctrines are sound and his sermons short we read the papers together over our wine not two months ago we read our old friend howe's glorious deed of the first of june we were told how the noble rawdon who fought with us at fort clinton had joined the duke of york and to-day his royal highness is in full retreat before pichigrew and he and my son miles have taken valenciennes for nothing ah parson would you not like to put on your old sixty-third coat though i doubt mrs blake could never make the buttons and buttonholes meet again over your big body the boys were acting a play with my militia sword oh that i were young again mr blake that i had not the gout in my toe and i would saddle rosinante and ride back into the world 
and feel the pulses beat again and play a little of life's glorious game. The last hit which I saw played was gallantly won by our side, though tis true that even in this party the Americans won the rubber, our people gaining only the ground they stood on, and the guns, stores, and ships which they captured and destroyed, whilst our efforts at rescue were too late to prevent the catastrophe impending over Burgoyne's unfortunate army. After one of those delays which always were happening to retard our plans and weaken the blows which our chiefs intended to deliver, an expedition was got under way from New York at the close of the month of September, 77, that, could it have but advanced a fortnight earlier, might have saved the doomed force of Burgoyne. Sed dis aliter visum. The delay here was not Sir Henry Clinton's fault who could not leave his city unprotected, but the winds and weather which delayed the arrival of reinforcements which we had long awaited from England. The fleet which brought them brought us long and fond letters from home, with the very last news of the children under the care of their good on Hetty and their grandfather. The mother's heart yearned towards the absent young ones. She made me no reproaches, but I could read her importunities in her anxious eyes, her terrors for me, and her longing for her children. Why stay longer? she seemed to say. You who have no calling to this war, or to draw the sword against your countrymen, why continue to imperil your life and my happiness? I understood her appeal. We were to enter upon no immediate service of danger. I told her Sir Henry was only going to accompany the expedition for a part of the way. I would return with him, the reconnaissance over, and Christmas, please heaven, should see our family once more united in England. A force of three thousand men, including a couple of slender regiments of American loyalists and New York militia, with which latter my distinguished relative Mr. Will Esmond went as captain, was embarked at New York, and our armament sailed up the noble Hudson River that presents finer aspects than the Rhine in Europe, to my mind. Nor was any fire opened upon us from those beetling cliffs and precipitous palisades, as they are called, by which we sailed. The enemy, strange to say, being for once unaware of the movement we contemplated. Our first landing was on the eastern bank, at a place called Verplank's Point, whence the Congress troops withdrew after a slight resistance. Their leader, the tough old Putnam, so famous during the war, supposing that our march was to be directed towards the eastern highlands, by which we intended to penetrate to Burgoyne. Putnam fell back to occupy these passes, a small detachment of ours being sent forward as if in pursuit, which he imagined was to be followed by the rest of our force. Meanwhile, before daylight, two thousand men without artillery were carried over to Stony Point on the western shore, opposite from Planks, and under a great hill called the Dunderberg by the old Dutch lords of the stream, and which hangs precipitously over it. A little stream at the northern base of this mountain intersects it from the opposite height on which Fort Clinton stood, named not after our general, but after one of the two gentlemen of the same name, who were amongst the oldest and most respected of the provincial gentry of New York, and who were at this moment actually in command against Sir Henry. On the next height to Clinton is Fort Montgomery, and behind them rises a hill called Bear Hill, whilst at the opposite side of the magnificent stream stands St. Anthony's Nose, a prodigious peak indeed which the Dutch had quaintly christened. The attacks on the two forts were almost simultaneous. Half our men were detached for the assault on Fort Montgomery, under the brave Campbell, who fell before the rampart. Sir Henry, who would never be out of danger where he could find it, personally led the remainder, and hoped, he said, that we should have better luck than before the Sullivan Island. A path led up to the Dundenberg, so narrow as scarcely to admit three men to breast and in utter silence our whole force scaled it, wondering at every rugged step to meet with no opposition. The enemy had not even kept a watch on it, 
nor were we descried until we were descending the height, at the base of which we easily dispersed a small force sent hurriedly to oppose us. The firing which here took place rendered all idea of a surprise impossible. The fort was before us. With such arms as the troops had in their hands they had to assault, and silently and swiftly, in the face of the artillery playing upon them, the troops ascended the hill. The men had orders on no account to fire. Taking the colors of the 63rd and bearing them aloft, Sir Henry mounted with the stormers. The place was so steep that the men pushed each other over the wall and through the embrasures, and it was there that Lieutenant Joseph Blake, the father of a certain Joseph Clinton Blake, who looks with the eyes of affections on a certain young lady, presented himself to the living of Warrington by saving the life of the unworthy patron thereof. About a fourth part of the garrison, as we were told, escaped out of the fort, the rest being killed or wounded, or remaining our prisoners within the works. Fort Montgomery was, in like manner, stormed and taken by our people. And at night, as we looked down from the heights where the King's Standard had been just planted, we were treated to a splendid illumination in the river below. Under Fort Montgomery, and stretching over to that lofty prominence called St. Anthony's Nose, a boom and chain had been laid with a vast cost and labor, behind which several American frigates and galleys were anchored. The fort being taken, these ships attempted to get up the river in the darkness, out of the reach of guns which they knew must destroy them in the morning. But the wind was unfavorable, and escape was found to be impossible. The crews, therefore, took to the boats, and so landed, having previously set the ships on fire with all their sails set, and we beheld these magnificent pyramids of flame burning up to the heavens and reflected in the waters below, until, in the midst of prodigious explosions, they sank and disappeared. On the next day, a parliamentaire came in from the enemy to inquire as to the state of his troops left wounded or prisoners in our hands, and the Continental officer brought me a note which gave me a strange shock, for it showed that in the struggle of the previous evening my brother had been engaged. It was dated October 7th from Major General George Clinton's divisional headquarters, and it stated briefly that Colonel H. Warrington of the Virginia line hopes that Sir George Warrington escaped unhurt in the assault of last evening, from which the Colonel himself was so fortunate as to retire without the least injury. Never did I say my prayers more heartily and gratefully than on that night, devoutly thanking heaven that my dearest brother was spared, and making a vow at the same time to withdraw out of the fratricidal contest into which I only had entered because honor and duty seemed imperatively to call me. I own I felt an inexpressible relief when I had come to the resolution to retire, and betake myself to the peaceful shade of my own vines and fig-trees at home. I longed, however, to see my brother ere I returned, and asked and easily obtained an errand to the camp of the American General Clinton from our own chief. The headquarters of his division were now some miles up the river, and a boat and a flag of truce quickly brought me to the point where his outpickets received me on the shore. My brother was very soon with me. He had only lately joined General Clinton's division with letters from headquarters at Philadelphia, and he chanced to hear, after the attack on Fort Clinton, that I had been present during the affair. We passed a brief delightful night together. Mr. Sadie, who always followed Hal to the war, cooking a feast in honor of both his masters. There was but one bed of straw in the hut where we had quarters, and Hal and I slept on it side by side, as we had done when we were boys. We had a hundred things to say regarding past times and present. His kind heart gladdened when I told him of my resolve to retire to my acres and to take off the red coat which I wore. He flung his arms round it. "'Praise be God!' says he. "'Oh, heavens, George, think what might have happened had we met in the affair two nights ago.' And he turned quite pale at the thought. He eased my mind with respect to our mother. She was a bitter Tory, to be sure, but the chief had given special injunctions regarding her safety. 
and fanny hal's wife watches over her and she is as good as a company cried the enthusiastic husband isn't she clever isn't she handsome isn't she good cries hal never fortunately waiting for a reply to those ardent queries and to think that i was nearly marrying maria once oh mercy what an escape i had he added hagen prays for the king every morning and night at castlewood but they bolt the doors and nobody hears gracious powers his wife is sixty if she is a day and oh george the quantity she drinks is but why tell the failings of our good cousin i am pleased to think she lived to drink the health of king george after his old dominion had passed for ever from his sceptre the morning came when my brief mission to the camp was ended and the truest of friends and fondest of brothers accompanied me to my boat which lay waiting at the riverside we exchanged an embrace at parting and his hand held mine yet for a moment ere i stepped into the barge which bore me rapidly down the stream shall i see thee once more dearest and best companion of my youth i thought amongst our cold englishmen can i ever hope to meet with a friend like thee when hadst thou ever a thought that was not kindly and generous when a wish or a possession but for me you would sacrifice it how brave are you and how modest how gentle and how strong how simple unselfish and humble how eager to see others merit how diffident of your own he stood on the shore till his figure grew dim before me there was that in my eyes which prevented me from seeing him longer brilliant as sir henry's success had been it was achieved as usual too late and served but as a small set-off against the disaster of burgoyne which ensued immediately and which our advance was utterly inadequate to relieve more than one secret messenger was dispatched to him who never reached him and of whom we never learned the fate of one wretch who offered to carry intelligence to him and whom sir henry dispatched with a letter of his own we heard the miserable doom falling in with some of the troops of general george clinton who happened to be in red uniform part of the prize of a british ship's cargo doubtless which had been taken by american privateers the spy thought he was in the english army and advanced towards the sentries he found his mistake too late his letter was discovered upon him and he had to die for bearing it in ten days after the success at the forts occurred the great disaster at saratoga of which we carried the dismal particulars in the fleet which bore us home i am afraid my wife was unable to mourn for it she had her children her father her sister to revisit and daily and nightly thanks to pay to heaven that had brought her husband safe out of danger end of chapter ninety one Chapter ninety two of the Virginians. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Virginians by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter ninety two. Under Vine and Fig Tree. Need I describe, young folks, the delights of the meeting at home, and the mother's happiness with all her brood once more under her fond wings? it was wrote in her face and acknowledged on her knees our house was large enough for all but aunt hetty would not stay in it she said fairly that to resign her motherhood over the elder children who had been hers for nearly three years caused her too great a pang and she could not bear for yet a while to be with them and to submit to take only the second place so she and her father went away to a house at bury st edmund's not far from us where they lived and where she spoiled her eldest nephew and niece in private it was the year that we came home that mr b the jamaica planter died who left her the half of his fortune and then i heard for the first time how the worthy gentleman had been greatly enamoured of her in jamaica and though she had refused him had thus shown his constancy to her heaven knows how much property of aunt hetty's monsieur miles hath already devoured 
the price of his commission and outfit, his gorgeous uniforms, his play debts and little transactions in the minories. Do you think, sirrah, I do not know what human nature is? What is the cost of Pall Mall taverns? Betis supers play even in moderation at the cocoa tree? And that a gentleman cannot purchase all these enjoyments with five hundred a year, which I allow him? Aunt Hetty declares she has made up her mind to be an old maid. I made a vow never to marry until I could find a man as good as my dear father, she said, and I never did, Sir George. No, my dearest Theo, not half as good, and Sir George may put that in his pipe and smoke it. And yet, when the good general died, calm and full of years and glad to depart, I think it was my wife who shed the most tears. I weep because I think I did not love him enough, said the tender creature whereas Hetty scarce departed from her calm, at least outwardly and before any of us, talks of him constantly still as though he were alive, recalls his merry sayings, his gentle kind ways with his children, when she brightens up and looks herself quite a girl again, and sits cheerfully looking up to the slab in church which records his name and some of his virtues, and for once tells no lies. I had fancied sometimes that my brother Hal, for whom Hetty had a juvenile passion, always retained a hold of her heart, and when he came to see us ten years ago, I told him of this childish romance of Het's, with the hope, I own, that he would ask her to replace Mrs. Fanny, who had been gathered to her father's, and regarding whom my wife, with her usual propensity to consider herself a miserable sinner, always reproached herself because, forsooth, she did not regret Fanny enough. Hal, when he came to us, was plunged in grief about her loss, and vowed that the world did not contain such another woman. Our dear old general, who was still in life then, took him in and housed him as he had done in the happy early days. The women played him the very same tunes which he had heard when a boy at Oakhurst. Everybody's heart was very soft with old recollections, and Harry never tired of pouring out his griefs and his recitals of his wife's virtues to Het, and anon of talking fondly about his dear Aunt Lambert, whom he loved with all his heart, and whose praises, you may be sure, were welcome to the faithful old husband, out of whose thoughts his wife's memory was never, I believe, absent for any three waking minutes of the day. General Hal went to Paris as an American general officer in his blue and yellow, which Mr. Fox and other gentlemen had brought into fashion here likewise, and was made much of at Versailles, although he was presented by Monsieur le Marquis de Lafayette to the most Christian king and queen, who did not love Monsieur le Marquis. And I believe a Marquise took a fancy to the Virginian general, and would have married him out of hand had he not resisted, and fled back to England and Warrington and Bury again, especially to the latter place where the folks would listen to him as he talked about his late wife with an endless patience and sympathy. As for us who had known the poor paragon, we were civil but not quite so enthusiastic regarding her, and rather puzzled sometimes to answer our children's questions about Uncle Hal's angel wife. The two generals and myself, and Captain Miles, and Parson Blake, who was knocked over at Monmouth the year after I left America, and came home to change his coat and take my living, used to fight the battles of the Revolution over our bottle, and the parson used to cry, By Jupiter, General! He compounded for Jupiter when he laid down his military habit. You are the Tory, and Sir George is the Whig. He is always finding fault with our leaders, and you are forever standing up for them. And when I prayed for the king last Sunday, I heard you following me quite loud. And so I do, Blake, with all my heart. I can't forget I wore his coat, says Hal. Ah, if Wolfe had been alive for twenty years more, says Lambert. Ah, sir, cries Hal, you should hear the general talk about him. "'What general?' says I, to vex him. "'My general,' says Hal, standing up, 
and filling a bumper, His Excellency General George Washington. With all my heart, cry I, but the parson looks as if he did not like the toast or the claret. Hal never tired in speaking of his general, and it was on some such evening of friendly converse that he told us how he had actually been in disgrace with this general whom he loved so fondly. Their difference seems to have been about Monsieur le Marquis de Lafayette, before mentioned, who played such a fine part in history of late, and who hath so suddenly disappeared out of it. His previous rank in our own service, and his acknowledged gallantry during the war, ought to have secured Colonel Warrington's promotion in the Continental Army, where a whippersnapper like Monsieur de Lafayette had but to arrive and straightway to be complimented by Congress with the rank of Major General. Hal, with the freedom of an old soldier, had expressed himself somewhat contemptuously regarding some of the appointments made by Congress, with whom all sorts of miserable intrigues and cabals were set to work by unscrupulous officers who were greedy of promotion. Mr. Warrington, imitating perhaps in this the example of his now illustrious friend of Mount Vernon, affected to make the war and gentle home, took his pay, to be sure, but spent it upon comforts and clothing for his men, and as for rank, declared it was a matter of no earthly concern to him, and that he would as soon serve as colonel as in any higher grade. No doubt he added contemptuous remarks regarding certain general officers of Congress Army, their origin, and the causes of their advancement. Notably, he was very angry about the sudden promotion of the young French lad just named, the Marquis, as they loved to call him, in the Republican Army, and who, by the way, was a prodigious favorite of the chief himself. There were not three officers in the whole Continental Force, after poor Madcap Lee was taken prisoner and disgraced, who could speak the Marquis's language, so that Hal could judge the young Major General more closely and familiarly than other gentlemen, including the Commander-in-Chief himself. Mr. Washington good-naturedly rated friend Hal for being jealous of the beardless commander of Auvergne, was himself not a little pleased by the filial regard and profound veneration which the enthusiastic young gentleman always showed for him, and had, moreover, the very best politic reasons for treating the Marquis with friendship and favor. Meanwhile, as it afterwards turned out, the commander-in-chief was most urgently pressing Colonel Warrington's promotion upon Congress. And, as if his difficulties before the enemy were not enough, he being at this hard time of winter entrenched at Valley Forge, commanding five or six thousand men at the most, almost without fire, blankets, food, or ammunition, in the face of Sir William Howe's army, which was perfectly appointed, and three times as numerous as his own, as if I say this difficulty was not enough to try him, he had further to encounter the cowardly distrust of Congress, and insubordination and conspiracy amongst the officers in his own camp. During the awful winter of 77, when one blow struck by the sluggard at the head of the British forces might have ended the war, and all was doubt, confusion, despair in the opposite camp, save in one indomitable breast alone, my brother had an interview with the chief, which he has subsequently described to me, and of which Hal could never speak without giving way to the deepest emotion. Mr. Washington had won no such triumph as that which the daredevil courage of Arnold and the elegant imbecility of Burgoyne had procured for Gates and the Northern Army. Save in one or two minor encounters, which proved how daring his bravery was, and how unceasing his watchfulness, General Washington had met with defeat after defeat from an enemy in all points his superior. The Congress mistrusted him. Many an officer in his own camp hated him. Those who had been disappointed in ambition, those who had been detected in peculation, those whose selfishness or incapacity his honest eyes had spied out, were all more or less in league against him. Gates was the chief towards whom the malcontents turned. 
Mr. Gates was the only genius fit to conduct the war, and with a vaingloriousness which he afterwards generally owned, he did not refuse the homage which was paid him. To show how dreadful were the troubles and anxieties with which General Washington had to contend, I may mention what at this time was called the Conway Cabal, a certain Irishman, a chevalier of St. Louis, and an officer in the French service, arrived in America early in the year 77 in quest of military employment. He was speedily appointed to the rank of brigadier, and could not be contented, forsooth, without an immediate promotion to be major general. Mr. C. had friends at Congress, who, as the general-in-chief was informed, had promised him his speedy promotion. General Washington remonstrated, representing the injustice of promoting to the highest rank the youngest brigadier in the service, and whilst the matter was pending was put in possession of a letter from Conway to General Gates, whom he complimented, saying that heaven had been determined to save America, or a weak general and bad counsellors would have ruined it. The general enclosed the note to Mr. Conway without a word of comment and Conway offered his resignation, which was refused by Congress, who appointed him Inspector General of the Army with the rank of Major General. And it was at this time, says Harry, with many passionate exclamations indicating his rage with himself and his admiration of his leader, when by heavens the glorious chief was oppressed by troubles enough to drive ten thousand men mad, that I must interfere with my jealousies about the Frenchman. I had not said much, only some nonsense to Green and Cadwallader about getting some frogs against the Frenchman came to dine with us, and having a bag full of marquises over from Paris, as we were not able to command ourselves. But I should have known the chief's troubles, and that he had a better head than mine, and might have had the grace to hold my tongue. For a while the general said nothing, but I could remark by the coldness of his demeanour that something had occurred to create a schism between him and me. Mrs. Washington, who had come to camp, also saw that something was wrong. Women have artful ways of soothing men and finding their secrets out. I am not sure that I should have ever tried to learn the cause of the general's displeasure, for I am as proud as he is, and besides, says Hal, when the chief is angry, it was not pleasant coming near him, I can promise you. My brother was indeed subjugated by his old friend, and obeyed him and bowed before him as a boy before a schoolmaster. At last, Hal resumed, Mrs. Washington found out the mystery. Speak to me after dinner, Colonel Hal, says she. Come out to the parade ground, before the dining house, and I will tell you all. I left a half-score of general officers and brigadiers drinking round the general's table, and found Mrs. Washington waiting for me. She then told me it was the speech I had made about the box of marquises with which the general was offended. I should not have heeded it in another, he had said, but I never thought Harry Warrington would have joined against me. I had to wait on him for the word that night, and found him alone at his table. "'Can your Excellency give me five minutes' time?' I said, with my heart in my mouth. "'Yes, yeah, surely,' says he, pointing to the other chair. "'Will you please to be seated?' "'It used not always to be Sir and Colonel Warrington between me and your Excellency,' I said. He said calmly, "'The times are altered.' "'Et nos mutamur in illis,' says I. "'Times and people are both changed.' "'You had some business with me?' he asked. "'Am I speaking to the commander-in-chief, or to my old friend?' I asked. He looked at me gravely. "'Well, to both, sir,' he said. "'Pray, sit, Harry.' If to General Washington, I tell His Excellency that I, and many officers of this army, are not well pleased to see a boy of twenty made a major general over us because he is a marquis and because he can't speak the english language if i speak to an old friend i have to say that he has shown me very little of trust or friendship for the last few weeks 
and that I have no desire to sit at your table and have impertinent remarks made by others there of the way in which His Excellency turns his back on me. Which charge shall I take first, Harry? he asked, turning his chair away from the table and crossing his legs as if ready for a talk. You are jealous, as I gather, about the Marquis? Jealous, sir, says I. An aide-de-camp of Mr. Wolfe is not jealous of a jack a dandy who five years ago was being whipped at school. You yourself declined higher rank than that which you hold, says the chief, turning a little red. But I never bargained to have a macaroni marquis to command me, I cried. I will not for one carry the young gentleman's orders. And since Congress and Your Excellency chooses to take your generals out of the nursery, I shall humbly ask leave to resign and retire to my plantation. Do, Harry, that is true friendship, says the chief, with a gentleness that surprised me. Now that your old friend is in a difficulty, tis surely the best time to leave him. Sir, says I, do as so many of the rest are doing, Mr. Warrington. Et tu, Brute, as the play says. Well, well, Harry, I did not think it of you, but at least you were in the fashion. You asked which charge you should take first, I said. Oh, the promotion of the Marquis? I recommended the appointment to Congress, no doubt. And you and other gentlemen disapprove it. I have spoken for myself, sir, says I. If you take me in that tone, Colonel Warrington, I have nothing to answer, says the chief, rising up very fiercely, and presume that I can recommend officers for promotion without asking your previous sanction. Being on that tone, sir, says I, let me respectfully offer my resignation to your excellency founding my desire to resign upon the fact that Congress, at Your Excellency's recommendation, offers its highest commands to boys of twenty, who are scarcely even acquainted with our language. And I rise up and make His Excellency a bow. Great heavens, Harry, he cries. About this Marquis's appointment he was beaten, that was the fact, and he could not reply to me. Can't you believe that in this critical time of our affairs, there are reasons why special favor should be shown to the first Frenchman of distinction who comes amongst us? No doubt, sir. If Your Excellency acknowledges that Monsieur de Lafayette's merits have nothing to do with the question. I acknowledge or deny nothing, sir, says the General with a stamp of his foot and looking as though he could be terribly angry if he would. Am I here to be catechized by you? Stay. Hark, Harry. I speak to you as a man of the world, nay, as an old friend. This appointment humiliates you and others, you say? Be it so. Must we not bear humiliation, along with the other burdens and griefs, for the sake of our country? It is no more just, perhaps, that the Marquis should be set over you, gentlemen, than that your Prince Ferdinand or your Prince of Wales at home should have a command over veterans. But if in appointing this young nobleman, we please a whole nation, and bring ourselves twenty millions of allies. Will you and other gentlemen sulk because we do him honor? Tis easy to sneer at him, though, believe me, the Marquis has many more merits than you allow him. To my mind, it were more generous, as well as more polite, of Harry Warrington, to welcome this stranger for the sake of the prodigious benefit our country may draw from him. Not to laugh at his peculiarities, but to aid him and help his ignorance by your experience as an old soldier. That is what I would do. That is the part I expected of thee, for it is the generous and manly one, Harry. But you choose to join my enemies, and when I am in trouble you say you will leave me. That is why I have been hurt. That is why I have been cold. I thought I might count on your friendship, and, and you can tell whether I was right or no. I relied on you as a brother and you come and tell me you will resign. Be it so. Being embarked in this contest, by God's will, I will see it to an end. You are not the first, Mr. Warrington, has left me on the way. He spoke with so much tenderness, and as he spoke his face wore such a look of unhappiness that an extreme remorse and pity seized me, and I called out I know not what incoherent expressions regarding old times, and vowed that if he would say the word, 
I never would leave him. You never loved him, George, says my brother, turning to me, but I did, beyond all mortal men, and, though I am not clever like you, I think my instinct was in the right. He has a greatness not approached by other men. I don't say no, brother, said I, now. Greatness, pooh, says the parson, growling over his wine. We walked into Mrs. Washington's tea-room arm in arm, Hal resumed. She looked up quite kind, and saw we were friends. "'Is it all over, Colonel Harry?' she whispered. "'I know. He has applied ever so often about your promotion.' "'I never will take it,' says I. "'And that is how I came to do penance,' says Harry, telling me the story, with Lafayette the next winter. Hal could imitate the Frenchman very well. "'I will go with him,' says I. "'I know the way to Quebec, and when we are not in action with Sagui, I can hear His Excellency the Major General say his lesson.' "'There was no fight. You know we could get no army to act in Canada, and return to headquarters. And what do you think disturbed the Frenchman most? The idea that people would laugh at him because his command had come to nothing.' And so they did laugh at him, and almost to his face, too, and who could help it? If our chief had any weak point, it was this Marquis. After our little difference, we became as great friends as before, if a man may be said to be friends with a sovereign prince, for as such I somehow could not help regarding the general. And one night, when we had sat the company out, we talked of old times, and the jolly days of sport we had together both before and after Braddock's. And that pretty duel you were near having when we were boys. He laughed about it, and said he never saw a man look more wicked and more bent on killing than you did. And to do Sir George justice, I think he has hated me ever since, says the chief. Ah, he added, an open enemy I can face readily enough. "'Tis the secret foe who causes the doubt and anguish. "'We have sat with more than one at my table to-day, "'to whom I am obliged to show a face of civility, "'whose hands I must take when they are offered, "'though I know they are stabbing my reputation "'and are eager to pull me down from my place. "'You spoke but lately of being humiliated "'because a junior was set over you in command. "'What humiliation is yours compared to mine?' who have to play the farce of welcome to these traitors, who have to bear the neglect of Congress, and see men who have insulted me promoted in my own army. If I consulted my own feelings as a man, would I continue in this command? You know whether my temper is naturally warm or not, and whether as a private gentleman I should be likely to suffer such slights and outrages as are put upon me daily. But in the advancement of the sacred cause in which we are engaged, we have to endure not only hardship and danger, but calumny and wrong, and may God give us strength to do our duty. And then the general showed me the papers regarding the affair of that fellow Conway, whom Congress promoted in spite of the intrigue, and down whose black throat John Cadwallader sent the best ball he ever fired in his life. And it was here said hal concluding his story as i looked at the chief talking at night in the silence of the camp and remembered how lonely he was and what an awful responsibility he carried how spies and traitors were eating out of his dish and an enemy lay in front of him who might at any time overpower him that i thought sure this is the greatest man now in the world and what a wretch i am to think of my jealousies and annoyances whilst he is walking serenely under his immense cares. "'We talked but now of Wolfe,' said I. "'Here indeed is a greater than Wolf. "'To endure is greater than to dare, "'to tire out hostile fortune, "'to be daunted by no difficulty, "'to keep heart when all have lost it, "'to go through intrigue spotless, "'and to forgo even ambition when the end is gained.' Who can say this is not greatness, or show the other Englishman who has achieved so much? I wonder, Sir George, you did not take Mr. Washington's side and wear the blue and buff yourself, grumbles Parson Blake. You and I thought scarlet most becoming to our complexion, Joe Blake, says Sir George, 
and my wife thinks there would not have been room for two such great men on one side. Well, at any rate, you were better than that odious, swearing, crazy General Lee, who was second in command, cries Lady Warrington. What did the general say about George's tragedies, Harry? Harry burst into a roar of laughter, in which, of course, Mr. Miles must join his uncle. Well, says he, it is a fact that Hagen read one at my house to the general and Mrs. Washington, and several more, and they all fell sound asleep. He never liked my husband, that is the truth, says Theo, tossing up her head, and tis all the more magnanimous of Sir George to speak so well of him. And then Hal told how, his battles over, his country freed, his great work of liberation complete, the general laid down his victorious sword and met his comrades of the army in a last adieu. The last British soldier had quitted the shore of the Republic, and the commander-in-chief proposed to leave New York for Annapolis, where Congress was sitting, and there resign his commission. About noon on the 4th December, a barge was in waiting at Whitehall Ferry to convey him across the Hudson. The chiefs of the army assembled at a tavern near the ferry, and there the general joined them. Seldom as he showed his emotion outwardly on this day he could not disguise it. He filled a glass of wine and said, I bid you farewell with a heart full of love and gratitude, and wish your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as those past have been glorious and honorable. Then he drank to them. I cannot come to each of you to take my leave, he said, but shall be obliged if you will each come and shake me by the hand. General Knox, who was nearest, came forward, and the chief, with tears in his eyes, embraced him. The others came, one by one, to him, and took their leave without a word. A line of infantry was formed from the tavern to the ferry, and the general, with his officers following him, walked silently to the water. He stood up in the barge, taking off his hat, and waving a farewell, and his comrades remained bareheaded on the shore till their leader's boat was out of view. As Harry speaks very low in the grey of evening, with sometimes a break in his voice, we all sit touched and silent. Hetty goes up and kisses her father. "'You tell us of others, General Harry,' she says, passing a handkerchief across her eyes, "'of Marion and Sumter, of Green and Wayne, of Rawdon and Cornwallis, too. But you never mention Colonel Warrington. My dear, he will tell you his story in private, whispers my wife, clinging to her sister, and you can write it for him. But it was not to be. My lady Theo, and her husband, too, I own, catching the infection from her, never would let Harry rest until we had coaxed, wheedled, and ordered him to ask Hetty in marriage. He obeyed, and it was she who now declined. She had always, she said, the truest regard for him from the dear old times when they had met as almost children together, but she would never leave her father. When it pleased God to take him, she hoped she would be too old to think of bearing any other name but her own. Harry should have her love always as the best of brothers, and as George and Theo have such a nursery full of children, adds Hester, we must show our love to them by saving for the young ones. She sent him her answer in writing, leaving home on a visit to friends at a distance, as though she would have him to understand that her decision was final. As such, Hal received it. He did not break his heart. Cupid's arrows, ladies, don't bite very deep into the tough skins of gentlemen of our age. Though, to be sure, at the time of which I write, my brother was still a young man, being little more than fifty. Aunt Het is now a staid little lady with a voice of which years have touched the sweet chords, and a head which time has powdered over with silver. There are days when she looks surprisingly young and blooming. Ah, me, my dear, it seems but a little while since the hair was golden brown and the cheeks as fresh as roses and then came the bitter blast of love unrequited which withered them, and that long loneliness of heart which they say follows. Why would Theo and I have been so happy and thou so lonely? Why should my meal be garnished with love and spread with plenty, 
while yon solitary outcast shivers at my gate. I bow my head humbly before the dispenser of pain and poverty, wealth and health. I feel sometimes as if for the prizes which have fallen to the lot of me unworthy. I did not dare to be grateful. But I hear the voices of my children in their garden, or look up at their mother from my book, or perhaps my sick bed, and my heart fills with instinctive gratitude towards the bountiful heaven that has so blessed me. Since my accession to my uncle's title and estate, my intercourse with my good cousin Lord Castlewood had been very rare. I had always supposed him to be a follower of the winning side in politics, and was not a little astonished to hear of his sudden appearance in opposition. A disappointment in respect to a place at court, of which he pretended to have had some promise, was partly the occasion of his rupture with the ministry. It is said that the most august person in the realm had flatly refused to receive into the royal household a nobleman whose character was so notoriously bad, and whose example, so the august objector was pleased to say, would ruin and corrupt any respectable family. I heard of the Castlewoods during our travels in Europe, and that the mania for play had again seized upon his lordship. His impaired fortunes, having been retrieved by the prudence of his wife and father-in-law, he had again begun to dissipate his income at Ombre and Lansquenet. There were tales of malpractices in which he had been discovered, and even of chastisement inflicted upon him by the victims of his unscrupulous arts. His wife's beauty and freshness faded early. We met but once at Aix-la-Chapelle, where Lady Castlewood besought my wife to go and see her, and afflicted Lady Warrington's kind heart by stories of the neglect and outrage of which her unfortunate husband was guilty. We were willing to receive these as some excuse and palliation for the unhappy lady's own conduct. A notorious adventure gambler and spadassin, calling himself the Chevalier de Barry, and said to be a relative of the mistress of the French king, but afterwards turning out to be an Irishman of low extraction, was in constant attendance upon the Earl and Countess at this time, and conspicuous for the audacity of his lies, the extravagance of his play, and somewhat mercenary gallantry towards the other sex, and a ferocious bravo courage which, however, failed him on one or two awkward occasions, if common report said true. He subsequently married and rendered miserable a lady of title and fortune in England. The poor little American lady's interested union with Lord Castlewood was scarcely more happy. I remember our little Miles' infantile envy being excited by learning that Lord Castlewood's second son, a child a few months younger than himself, was already an ensign on the Irish establishment, whose pay the fond parents regularly drew. This piece of preferment my lord must have got for his cadet, whilst he was on good terms with the minister, during which period of favour Will Esmond was also shifted off to New York. Whilst I was in America myself, we read in an English journal that Captain Charles Esmond had resigned his commission in his majesty's service as not wishing to take up arms against the countrymen of his mother the countess of castlewood it is the doing of the old fox vandenbosch madame esmond said he wishes to keep his virginian property safe whatever side should win i may mention with respect to this old worthy that he continued to reside in england for a while after the declaration of independence not at all denying his sympathy with the American cause, but keeping a pretty quiet tongue and alleging that such a very old man as himself was past the age of action or mischief, in which opinion the government concurred, no doubt, as he was left quite unmolested. But of a sudden a warrant was out after him, when it was surprising with what agility he stirred himself and skipped off to France, whence he presently embarked upon his return to Virginia. The old man bore the worst reputation amongst the loyalists of our colony, and was nicknamed Jack the Painter amongst them, much to his indignation, after a certain miscreant who was hung in England for burning naval stores in our ports there. 
he professed to have lost prodigious sums at home by the persecution of the government, distinguished himself by the loudest patriotism and the most violent religious outcries in Virginia, where, nevertheless, he was not much more liked by the Whigs than by the party who still remained faithful to the crown. He wondered that such an old Tory as Madame Esmond of Castlewood was suffered to go at large, and was forever crying out against her amongst the gentlemen of the new assembly, the governor, and officers of the state. He and Fanny had high words in Richmond one day, when she told him he was an old swindler and traitor, and that the mother of Colonel Henry Warrington, the bosom friend of His Excellency the Commander-in-Chief, was not to be insulted by such a little smuggling slave-driver as him. I think it was in the year 1780 an accident happened, when the old register office at Williamsburg was burned down, in which there was a copy of the formal assignment of the Virginia property from Francis Lord Castlewood to my grandfather Henry Esmond, Esquire. Oh, says Fanny, of course this is the work of Jack the Painter and Mr. Vandenbosch was for prosecuting her for libel, but that Fanny took to her bed at this juncture and died. Vandenbosch made contracts with the new government and sold them bargains, as the phrase is. He supplied horses, meat, forage, all of bad quality. But when Arnold came into Virginia, in the king's service, and burned right and left, Vandenbosch's stores and tobacco houses somehow were spared. Some secret Whigs now took their revenge on the old rascal. A couple of his ships in James River, his stores, and a quantity of his cattle in their stalls were roasted amidst a hideous bellowing, and he got a note, as he was in Arnold's company, saying that friends had served him as he served others, and containing Tom the Glazier's compliments to brother Jack the Painter. Nobody pitied the old man though he went well nigh mad at his loss. In Arnold's suite came the Honorable Captain William Esmond of the New York Loyalists as aide-de-camp to the general. When Howe occupied Philadelphia, Will was said to have made some money keeping a gambling house with an officer of the dragoons of Anspach. I know not how he lost it. He could not have had much when he consented to become an aide-de-camp of Arnold's. Now, the king's officers having reappeared in the province, Madame Esmond thought fit to open her house at Castlewood and invite them thither, and actually received Mr. Arnold and his suite. "'It is not for me,' she said, "'to refuse my welcome to a man whom my sovereign has admitted to grace.' And she threw her house open to him, and treated him with great, though frigid, respect whilst he remained in the district the general gone, and his precious aide to camp with him, some of the rascals who followed in their suite remained behind in the house where they had received so much hospitality, insulted the old lady in her hall, insulted her people, and finally set fire to the old mansion in a frolic of drunken fury. Our house at Richmond was not burned, luckily, though Mr. Arnold had fired the town and thither the undaunted old lady proceeded, surrounded by her people and never swerving in her loyalty, in spite of her ill-usage. The Esmonds, she said, were accustomed to royal ingratitude. And now Mr. Vandenbosch, in the name of his grandson and my lord Castlewood in England, set up a claim to our property in Virginia. He said it was not my lord's intention to disturb Madame Esmond in her enjoyment of the estate during her life, but that his father, it had always been understood, had given his kinsman a life interest in the place, and only continued it to his daughter out of generosity. Now my lord proposed that his second son should inhabit Virginia, for which the young gentleman had always shown the warmest sympathy. The outcry against Vandenbosch was so great that he would have been tarred and feathered had he remained in Virginia. He betook himself to Congress, represented himself as a martyr ruined in the cause of liberty, and prayed for compensation for himself and justice for his grandson. My mother lived long in dreadful apprehension, having in truth a secret which she did not like to disclose to anyone. Her titles were burned. 
the deed of assignment in her own house, the copy in the registry at Richmond, had alike been destroyed. By chance? By villainy? Who could say? She did not like to confide this trouble in writing to me. She opened herself to Hal after the surrender of Yorktown, and he acquainted me with the fact in a letter by a British officer returning home on his parole. Then I remembered the unlucky words I had let slip before Will Esmond at the coffee house at New York, and a part of this iniquitous scheme broke upon me. As for Mr. Will, there is a tablet in Castlewood Church in Hampshire, inscribed, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, and announcing that this marble is placed by a mourning brother to the memory of the Honorable William Esmond Esquire, who died in North America in the service of the king. But how? When, towards the end of 1781, a revolt took place in the Philadelphia line of the Congress Army, and Sir Henry Clinton sent out agents to the mutineers, what became of them? The men took the spies prisoners, and proceeded to judge them, and my brother, whom they knew and loved, and had often followed under fire, who had been sent from camp to make terms with the troops, recognized one of the spies, just as execution was about to be done upon him, and the wretch, with horrid outcries, groveling and kneeling at Colonel Warrington's feet, besought him for mercy, and promised to confess all to him. To confess what? Harry turned away sick at heart. Will's mother and sister never knew the truth. They always fancied it was in action he was killed. As for my Lord Earl, whose noble son has been the intendant of an illustrious prince, and who has enriched himself at play with his royal master, I went to see his lordship when I heard of this astounding design against our property, and remonstrated with him on the matter. For myself, as I showed him, I was not concerned, as I had determined to cede my right to my brother. He received me with perfect courtesy, smiled when I spoke of my disinterestedness, said he was sure of my affectionate feelings towards my brother, but what must be his towards his son? He had always heard from his father, he would take his Bible oath of that, that at my mother's death the property would return to the head of the family. At the story of the title which Colonel Esmond had ceded, he shrugged his shoulders and treated it as a fable. On ne fait pas de ces folies là says he, offering me snuff. And your grandfather was a man of esprit. My little grandmother was a prise of him and my father, the most good-natured soul alive, lent them the Virginian property to get them out of the way. C'est tout un scandale, mon cher, un joli petit scandale. Oh, if my mother had but heard him, I might have been disposed to take a high tone, but he said with the utmost good-nature, My dear knight, you are going to fight about the character of our grandmother? Allons donc. Come, I will be fair with you. We will compromise, if you like, about this Virginian property. And his lordship named a sum greater than the actual value of the estate. Amazed at the coolness of this worthy, I walked away to my coffee-house, where, as it happened, an old friend was to dine with me, for whom I have a sincere regard. I had felt a pang at not being able to give this gentleman my living of Warrington on Waveney, but I could not, as he himself confessed honestly. His life had been too loose, and his example in my village could never have been edifying. Besides, he would have died of ennui there, after being accustomed to a town life, and he had a prospect, finally, he told me, of setting himself most comfortably in London and the church. He was the second incumbent of Lady Whittlesey's chapel, Mayfair, and married Elizabeth, relict of Herman Volker, Esquire, the eminent brewer. My guest, I need not say, was my old friend Sampson, who never failed to dine with me when I came to town, and I told him of my interview with his old patron. I could not have lighted upon a better confidant. Gracious powers, says Sampson, the man's roguery beats all belief. When I was secretary and factotum at Castlewood, 
I can take my oath I saw more than one copy of the deed of assignment by the late lord to your grandfather. In consideration of the love I bear to my kinsman, Henry Esmond Esquire, husband of my dear mother Rachel, Lady Viscountess Dowager of Castlewood, I, etc., so it ran. I know the place where tis kept. Let us go thither as fast as horses will carry us to-morrow. There is somebody there, never mind whom, Sir George, who has an old regard for me. The papers may be there to this very day, and, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, but I shall be thankful if I can in any way show my gratitude to you and your glorious brother. His eyes filled with tears. He was an altered man. At a certain period of the port wine, Samson always alluded with compunction to his past life and the change which had taken place in his conduct since the awful death of his friend Dr. Dodd. Quick as we were, we did not arrive at Castlewood too soon. I was looking at the fountain in the court, and listening to that sweet sad music of its splashing which my grandfather tells of in his memories, and peopling the place with bygone figures, with Beatrix in her beauty, with my Lord Francis in scarlet, calling to his dogs and mounting his grey horse, with the young page of old who won the castle and the heiress, when Samson comes running down to me with an old volume in rough calf-bound in his hand, containing drafts of letters, copies of agreements, and various writings, some by a secretary of my lord Francis, some in the slim handwriting of his wife, my grandmother, some bearing the signature of the last lord. And here was a copy of the assignment, sure enough, as it had been sent to my grandfather in Virginia. Victoria, Victoria! cries Samson, shaking my hand, embracing everybody. Here is a guinea for thee, Betty. We'll have a bowl of punch at the three castles to-night. As we were talking, the wheels of post-chases were heard, and a couple of carriages drove into the court containing my lord and a friend, and their servants in the next vehicle. His lordship looked only a little paler than usual at seeing me. What procures me the honour of Sir George Warrington's visit? And pray, Mr. Sampson, what do you do here? says my lord. I think he had forgotten the existence of this book, or had never seen it, and when he offered to take his Bible oath of what he had heard from his father, had simply volunteered a perjury. I was shaking hands with his companion, a nobleman with whom I had had the honour to serve in America. I came, I said, to convince myself of a fact about which you were mistaken yesterday, and I find the proof in your lordship's own house. Your lordship was pleased to take your lordship's Bible oath that there was no agreement between your father and his mother relative to some property which I hold. When Mr. Sampson was your lordship's secretary, he perfectly remembered having seen a copy of such an assignment. And here it is. And do you mean, Sir George Warrington, that unknown to me you have been visiting my papers? cries my lord. I doubted the correctness of your statement, though backed by your lordship's Bible oath, I said with a bow. This, sir, is robbery. Give the papers back, bawled my lord. Robbery is a rough word, my lord. Shall I tell the whole story to Lord Rawdon? What? Is it about the Marquisit? Conu, conu, my dear Sir George. We always called you the Marquis in New York. I don't know who brought the story from Virginia. I never had heard this absurd nickname before, and did not care to notice it. My Lord Castlewood, I said, not only doubted, but yesterday laid a claim to my property, taking his Bible oath that— Castlewood gave a kind of gasp, and then said, Great heaven! Do you mean, Sir George, that there actually is an agreement extant? Yes, here it is, my father's handwriting, sure enough. Then the question is clear. Upon my o well, upon my honour as a gentleman. I never knew of such an agreement, and must have been mistaken in what my father said. This paper clearly shows the property is yours, and not being mine, why, I wish you joy of it. And he held out his hand with the blandest smile. And how thankful you will be to me, my lord, for having enabled him to establish the right, says Samson, with a leer on his face. Thankful? 
"'No, confound you, not in the least,' says my lord. "'I am a plain man. I don't disguise from my cousin that I would rather have had the property than he. Sir George, you will stay and dine with us. A large party is coming down here shooting. We ought to have you one of us.' "'My lord,' said I, buttoning the book under my coat, "'I will go and get this document copied, and then return it to your lordship. "'As my mother in Virginia has had her papers burned, "'she will be put out of much anxiety by having this assignment safely lodged.' "'What? Have Madam Esmond's papers been burned? "'What the deuce was that?' asks my lord. "'My lord, I wish you a very good afternoon. "'Come, Samson, you and I will go and dine at the Three Castles.' and I turned on my heel, making a bow to Lord R., and from that day to this I have never set my foot within the halls of my ancestors. Shall I ever see the old mother again, I wonder? She lives in Richmond, never having rebuilt her house in the country. When Hal was in England, we sent her pictures of both her sons, painted by the admirable Sir Joshua Reynolds. We sat to him the last year Mr. Johnson was alive, I remember and the doctor, peering about the studio and seeing the image of Hal in his uniform, the appearance of it caused no little excitement in those days, asked who was this, and was informed that it was the famous American general, General Warrington, Sir George's brother. "'General who?' cries the doctor. "'General where? Pooh! I don't know such a service,' and he turned his back and walked out of the premises." My worship is painted in scarlet, and we have replicas of both performances at home. But the picture which Captain Miles and the girls declare to be the most like is a family sketch by my ingenious neighbor, Mr. Bunbury, who has drawn me and my lady with Monsieur Gumbo following us, and written under the piece, Sir George, my lady, and their master. Here my master comes. He has poked out all the house fires has looked to all the bolts, has ordered the whole male and female crew to their chambers, and begins to blow my candles out, and says, Time, Sir George, to go to bed, twelve o'clock. Bless me, so indeed it is, and I close my book and go to my rest with a blessing on those now around me asleep. End of chapter 92 Recording by Nick Bolka End of the Virginians by William Makepeace Thackeray